Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Medical Board of California's quarterly board meeting day two. Pursuant to the provisions of Governor Gavin Newsom's executive order N29-20, dated March 17, 2020, this meeting is being conducted via WebEx. Public comments will be heard for each agenda items for individuals wishing to do so. In order to be ready for public comment, we ask that you please ensure your comments can be heard clearly by connecting to the audio of this meeting through the proper method. If you're having difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting, it could be because the device you're connecting with has bandwidth limitations. If you do have difficulty hearing the audio of this meeting using your device, please click the ellipsis button at the bottom of the WebEx application or the audio and video menu option at the top of the WebEx application and then select switch audio. You will see an option to call in and will be provided with a telephone number, access code, and attendee ID that can be used to connect to the meeting via phone. Using the information provided, it will automatically disconnect your device's audio and connect your, net, your phone to the name you joined the meeting with. By using this method, if you are having audio problems with your device, this will allow you to still participate and hear the audio of the board meeting. Please see the instructions on how to connect link at the last page of the board agenda for step-by-step -step WebEx instructions, including screenshots. Thank you, President Lawson. You can now start the meeting. Thank you, Sean, and welcome back to um, all the members of the board, our board staff, and to all the members of the public who've joined us uh, this morning for our quarterly Medical Board of California meeting. I would like to ask all of the participants uh, to please uh, turn your cell phones and other devices to silent so that we don't have any interruptions during the meeting. Um, and I would like you to, to please mute yourself when you aren't speaking. Um, we did have a couple of times yesterday where there was some um, feedback. I don't know if that was uh, because of uh, a muting or unmuting issue, but if you could be um, diligent about uh, that, it would be uh, very much appreciated. Um, because the meeting is conducted via WebEx, <clears throat> and sometimes it's difficult for me to see who's speaking, I will ask that all board members and speakers please announce themselves by name before speaking, just for clarity of the official uh, record and to help uh, our minutes takers as well. Our board members, uh, excuse me, all board members are able to unmute themselves to speak during the meeting, but please, like I asked, do put yourself back on mute in order to reduce uh, background noise when you're not speaking. Following this online meeting etiquette will ensure the best audio quality for everyone. During each call for public comments from board members and speakers, we will ensure that all comments that can be accommodated are heard before we proceed with the agenda. Government code 11126.5 does allow a board to remove people who willfully interrupt a meeting and to clear the room or virtual space if order cannot be restored by removing uh, the disruptive people. We will have a designated time on the agenda for public comment and we will ask for public comment on each agenda item. This is an official business meeting of the Medical Board of California and as such disruptions will not be tolerated. The board welcomes public comments on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comments prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. As Sean mentioned earlier, during each agenda item, the host moderating this WebEx event will activate the Q&A feature of WebEx and will ask anyone wishing to make a public comment to indicate so by replying yes. The host will then call on individuals who indicated they wish to make public comments by name. The hand raising feature will also be available. When called upon, the host will unmute the microphone of the individual and they will have three minutes to make their public comment. The host will audibly announce when 15 seconds remain to conclude the public comment. After the three minutes have elapsed, the individual will be placed back on mute and only one public comment per agenda item will be allowed per attendee. Uh, please see page four of the agenda for specific WebEx instructions on how to connect from the link on the agenda and additional instructions. During agenda item 18, public comments on items not on the agenda, the board has limited the total public comment period for individuals to 40 minutes. Therefore, after 40 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. During public comment on any other agenda item, 20 minutes will be allowed for the comment period. And after 20 minutes, no further comments will be accepted. Again, each person will be limited to three minutes of comment per agenda item. The board's IT staff will assist me with receiving the comments via WebEx during this meeting. I would like to remind speakers to please stay on topic and keep your comments to the allotted time or less. Today's meeting will be run according to the Open Meeting Act as required by law, and we do plan to end today by 1.30 p.m. Just in terms of the order of our agenda before we get into our business, um, yesterday we were unable to get to items 13, 14, 15, and 16 on our agenda. 
and those items will be taken up following agenda item 23, uh, right before agenda item 24. Um, so with that, I would like to formally call the meeting to order at 9.05 a.m. and ask that the board members please unmute your computers. So Ms. Caldwell can please call the roll. Mr. Brooks. Here. Ms. Campaverdi. Present. Present. Dr. Gonadev. Here. Dr. Hawkins. Here. Dr. Helzer. Here. Dr. Krause. Present. Ms. Lawson. Here. Ms. Lubiano. Here. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Mr. Rue. Here. Dr. Thorpe. Mr. Watkins. Present. Dr. Yip. Dr. Dr. Yip. Is Dr. Yip on the line? I thought I saw him on the line. I just want to make sure we're not having an audio problem. Uh, he was here. He appears to have dropped off. Okay. Uh, we'll we'll let the group know if he rejoins. Uh, thank you, Valerie. A quorum is present. Uh, board members, please remute your computers. And I would like to remind all members um, that we will be taking a roll call vote on each action item. Moving on to agenda item 18, public comment on items not on the agenda. Before uh, I have Sean open it up. Locations or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such uh, discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to the board members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. Therefore, such discussions could create a conflict and could lead to a board decision being challenged in superior court. The board can receive public comments regarding the board's processes in general, but it cannot receive comments on specific case circumstances where a decision is still pending. In addition, the board would request the public to please address the board as a whole and not individual members. And please be aware that public comment during this agenda item should provide information to the board members and is not a, a discussion between the board members and the public. The only action board members can take is to listen to the public comments and decide whether they'd like a future agenda item on the topic. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Though this may seem at times like board members are not being responsive, following these guidelines is critical to ensure the rules of the Open Meeting Act are followed and to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. If you'd like to comment on an agenda item, please do wait until we get to that agenda item. Comments at this time are only for items not on the board's agenda. Please do limit your comments to three minutes. Sean, if you'd open up the uh, comment line for commenters, please. Yes, I've gone ahead and opened up the hand raising feature in the Q&A window for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Please indicate so at this time. Uh, first up, we have Eric Andrus. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. It's Eric Andrus. Since my internet went out yesterday, I need to go back and touch on a few things. As usual, I disagree with Howard. If a doctor gets 32 complaints on any one topic, it should be referred to as 32 complaints, not one. We don't want to give the medical board another way to twist information and be able to say, well, our records show he has just one complaint. It's important to know just how many different patients are complaining about a single doctor. How typical of CMA drone Howard to try and make it look better for doctors. This is what we mean by protecting doctors over patients. He wants it to look like doctors have less complaints than they actually have. I went back and listened to the video of the meeting where Christina said she had her copy of the board materials sometime last week. And TJ said he received a link 56 hours prior. How many board members had access to the meeting materials longer than just 48 hours prior? Government Code 54957.5 says agendas of public meetings and any other writings when distributed to all or a majority of all of the members of the legislative body or a local agency shall be made available upon request without delay. If a writing is distributed less than 72 hours prior to that meeting, the writing shall be made available for public inspection at the time the writing is distributed to all or a majority of all of the members of the body. You do realize this makes it look like you don't want us to have time to be able to research these materials so we have an opportunity to speak on them at the meeting. Consider this a public record request. I'd like documentation of when any of the board members first received a copy of the materials for this quarterly meeting. 
There's no excuse to get these materials out, even if they're not complete, less than 10 days prior to a meeting. I, in regard to the enforcement monitor, leave it to Deb and his CMA mentality to want to keep the status quo that protects doctors. I guess many of you forgot that Kimberly Kirkmeyer is the woman that was running the medical board when it was sued for not protecting one of its own employees for sexual misconduct. And you think she should be the person to pick someone to monitor whether the board is doing something wrong or not. She's the one that barnstormed around the offices, paranoid, wanting to know who was texting me on Facebook and then had my Facebook records subpoenaed. We caught her lying to us so many times it's a joke. There's a reason the DCA illegally denied my public record request when I asked for all the public complaints against her. She was promoted to DCA director right as you all were voting to settle the sexual misconduct lawsuit against the medical board. Suspicious? Highly. She didn't protect her own employee from sexual misconduct and to shut her up, they likely just moved her to the DCA. Sometimes you people are such a joke and so blind. You do live in a bubble, don't you? 15 seconds remain. Anyone who thinks Kimberly Kirkmeyer is a trustworthy person needs some therapy. Christina, the board may have asked for certain th items in the sunset report, but you did so without public input, which would have thwarted these conflicts now. Thanks. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Marion Hellinger. Marion, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Marian Hollingsworth. I'd like to express concern regarding yesterday's discussion on the confidential letter of advice from SB 806. Most of you on the board were fighting for the doctors on this matter with the confidential letter. You were pleased about having another tool, as you call it, to keep doctors in line. But more importantly, you were worried about the doctor's reputation and the importance of keeping a lucrative practice from going without a blemish. Here's the issue I have about this confidential letter. The patient's right to informed consent. Full informed consent, knowing all the risks and benefits of a treatment or procedure is what is really at risk with this letter. By forcing this letter on SB 806, you are taking away part of this informed consent process. How can any of us as patients get full informed consent without knowing the dark side of a doctor's background? You say the confidential letter will just be for minor things like maybe poor record keeping or falsifying records. But from my standpoint, knowing that my doctor received a letter for falsifying records means I acknowledge that my records could be altered by this doctor. A letter given for prescribing means this doctor could give me the wrong medication or the wrong dose. I should know this before I allow this doctor to treat me. By denying Californians the right to know about these letters, you were denying us full informed consent and that violates your mission to protect consumers. People can look up their doctors to check for other disciplines but not for these letters. I hope you run this by your legal department to see if it's against the law to deny patients full informed consent. At least give us the information so we can make our own decisions for our own health care. And just because other states and countries have this letter does not make it right. Remember, this is all the stuff our mothers always told us. Just because someone else does it doesn't mean you have to. Remember that there were laws that denied women and minority the right to vote years ago. Those were not right either. And uh, finally, on another subject, why didn't anyone answer Mr. Watkins question yesterday when he asked how much involvement the CMA had in SB 806? If the CMA had little or no involvement, why not just admit that? By not saying anything, you are tacitly admitting that the CMA has more of a hand in the sunset bill than you care to admit. And that makes you not only look bad, but biased as well. I hope one of you will come clean and talk about the CMA's hand in 806. Thank you. Let me just take the opportunity to please address the misinformation. We just heard and address your question. Questions about whether the CMA is involved in SB 806 or any other matters that come before the legislature should be addressed to the legislature or to CMA. We do not have any knowledge as to what CMA's interest is in that legislation or what their influence is with respect to that legislation. Those questions should be directed appropriately. Sean, let's move on to the next commenter. Next up, we have Sandra Martinez. Sandra, are you there? I am, I wasn't ready. Good morning, board members. Sandra Martinez here. You know, there is so much needless suffering going on in the state from the opioid restrictions, abusive masking, and withholding of safe and effective medicines from patients. Good doctors are restrained from providing genuine medical care and targeted if they do. Instead, they're encouraged to provide paint by numbers medicine determined by insurance and pharmaceutical collaboration. The care COVID patients receive in the state is shameful. 
and the big, biggest medical failure ever. The standard of care is still go home and wait until you're very sick. This is negligent and immoral. There are effective early treatments, including hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. Anyone who actually bothers to look at the research, analyze the research, has the ability to critically think and looks at the physicians that have successfully treated COVID knows these protocols work. To date, California's had about 64,000 COVID deaths. If hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin had been used early on, 50,000 people would still be alive. If doctors dare to provide ethical care for their patients using these drugs, the board targets them with fabricated claims and legal harassment. I don't care what your reasons are to keep good doctors from properly treating patients. I don't care if there's a bigger agenda to support the medical industry complex, nor do I care if it's something else. You are appointed to protect people from bad doctors. What I know from experience, and also what I heard yesterday, is that the bad ones are exonerated while the good ones are professionally and politically attacked. The CDC is not your boss. The AMA is not your boss. The California Medical Association is not your boss. Pharmaceutical and insurance companies are not your bosses. You answer to the people. We want answers. We want early, effective, safe treatments like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin. What you're doing is not right. Show you truly care about the people you claim to protect. Please undo these deadly restrictions today without fanfare, without politics, without drawn out procedures. Because every day you do not act is more deaths on you. Thank you for your time and please take action. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Sam Plantowski. Sam, are you there? Hey, it's Sam Plantowski. I urge the board today to lift all restrictions on ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine for pharmacists and pharmacies. I believe on the June 24th meeting, we addressed the same point and you passed a motion to set up some sort of committee to look at it. I don't see that reflected in the June 24th meeting minutes. I hope that could be addressed and you would take action on this today. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Michelle, are you there? Yes, I am. Please go ahead. Good morning. I'm Michelle Montserrat Ramos and I am from Consumer Watchdog. I realize how hard all of you have worked throughout the sunset process and on the sunset bill, but please understand how many hours and evenings we, the public, we, the advocates have spent working on this legislation as well. When I speak to you, I am representing not only my advocacy team, which spans the entire state, but I'm also speaking for thousands of Californians who can't be here until 830 at night or at 9 a.m. the next morning. I truly appreciate Board President Lawson's approach in working through the public's concerns and the board members' concerns. I appreciate Mr. Watkins and thank him for stepping out on the ledge and truly trying to make effective change here in support of consumer protection. I appreciate that the public has the opportunity to speak early in the process, but we don't get to respond to the board members' input, which leaves us with amendments that don't quite get to where we need them. When it came to the confidential letter of advice, we really needed minimal offenses that do not include quality of care cases as a guardrail. Again, I understand the rulemaking process. I have been through it with this board and spent five years fighting the board over legislation that the board wouldn't place into regulations until I went to a legislator and he forced you to. Everyone's ignoring the elephant in the room. I think the fee increase that you are left with is ridiculous. The concept that auto mechanics are loaning this board $12 million to stay afloat for a year is outrageous. Instead of a board member going after another, I highly suggest that the CMA leaders on this board, past, present, and otherwise, go to the association where you all have held high leadership positions with and convince them to allow this board the fee increase this board needs to survive. We, the public, are not the only ones that lost ground in the sunset review. You, the board, lost as well. We are talking about your financial existence here. We are all concerned about this board. Try saving this board. Thank you. 
Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Susan Lauren. Susan, are you there? Um, hi, can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Oh, fantastic. Um, I want to thank TJ and Dr. Mahmood for their no votes on the confidential letter issue yesterday. The public is entitled to decide for themselves what constitutes a minor infraction in order to make informed choices about their lives. I want to repeat a few points. One, legislators say doctors' lobbies are so strong they can't get bills passed. Two, patient records need to be co-authored. Patients will remain at risk as long as you look at the notes of offenders uh, to decide cases. Three, doctors lawyer up, yet victims are unable to because this process is based on wealth and privilege, not prevention or justice. Four, scapegoating TJ who speaks the truth is not good for patient safety. I've spent a decade looking at plastic surgeons. For years, I did so with a group of harmed women. In a quick search in 2019, I easily found multiple desperate reviews for 49 of the 55 members of the LASBC. Now I'm looking up the founders of liposuction, authors of their reference texts, and developers of their instruments. Also, 172 trainees and fellows listed on Dr. Malcolm Lesavoy's CV, and 295 plastic surgeons on the CMA list. One name after another lands me at predictable, desperate reviews by women. This is harmful, not healing. That's not medicine. Some reviews for Dr. Stephen Teitelbaum, voted one of America's best plastic surgeons in 2021, recommended by other plastic surgeons, are scathing. The women ask good questions. They're lied to by board-certified surgeons. They describe assaults, pain, trauma, disfiguration, health problems, and more. They detail how doctors create smear campaigns to reverse victim and oppressor. The women can't get lawyers due to tort reform, and legislators and medical boards don't help. The UC Denver Redistribution Study and others proves removal of sub-Q fat causes an increase in disease-producing visceral fat. Uh, studies prove bad outcomes, including increase in insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, fat embolus syndrome, and more. I created a liposuction questionnaire and passed it through patient harm circles beginning in 2013. Each woman, woman said she was lied to. Informed consent is a legal veil. Dr. Malcolm Lesavoy teaches at UCLA. I found a UCLA liposuction, liposuction syllabus. There's no science in it. Lesavoy taught Terry Dubrow, who lied in my case. I know women who claim to be harmed by both of them. Lesavoy doesn't understand that adipose removal from a women's estrogen-rich body parts can cause surgically induced menopause and other health problems. In his blog, Liposuction Ruined My Life, a man named Tom from Australia details how quack doctors with power-assisted liposuction tools stripped his muscles during liposuction. Berger did the same to me. Liposuction became popular before the remain. discovery. Okay, before the discovery of leptin or classification of fat as an endocrine organ, yet doctors have not paused from making cash to consider the damage they cause healthy people. They're not keeping up with science or preventing harm. I'm asking the same thing every time. I'm asking for prevention. I'm asking to change the law 1356.6, the liposuction code in California. And I've asked a lot of other Please things conclude. that you've all got written down. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I do not see any additional requests in queue. All right, thank you, Sean, and thank you to all of those uh, who took the uh, opportunity to come before us and present public comment this morning. We are going to move on to agenda item 19, which is a presentation on physician substance abuse disorders uh, with Dr. Skipper joining us. Uh, and Bill, perhaps you or another staff member will tee this up for us. Christina, can I take a, take a moment quickly before we get on to the next topic and just send out my condolences to one of our own, Dr. Thorpe, while he's going through a troubling time. Um, and I want to make a, a, a statement about, you know, when we have trauma in our life, it's important that we acknowledge that. And the board seems not to be the place for it, but we can make it the place just to be sensitive to what, when it happens to public advocates or when it happens to one of our own. And on this, in this matter, I just want to keep Dr. Thorpe and his family in our thoughts and our prayers, because 
it is what it, support is what gets us through this time. So I just want to take that moment and say thank you for the opportunity to say that. Thank you. Uh, All right, Madam, I'm sorry. Sorry, Madam President, uh, yes. the, the uh, Deputy Director Reggie Varghese will introduce Dr. Skipper. Terrific, thanks. Good morning, board members. Good morning, Dr. Skipper. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to Medical Board of California. We are happy that you are uh, finding your uh, busy from your busy schedule to join us this morning. And uh, just a matter of introducing Dr. Skipper. Uh, had personal experience in sitting and listening to Dr. Skipper at many conferences, and uh, uh, very well sp uh, uh, spoken. Uh, presenter on the topic uh, that we have today in front of us. Dr. Skipper has devoted his career uh, to assisting professionals in crisis, and he had worked extensively with uh, state regulatory boards throughout the country and, uh, and abroad, actually, and published over 100 articles regarding professional uh, impairment. And so uh, with, with that said, I would welcome Dr. Skipper and uh, We'll just uh, go to his presentation. Thank you. Thanks to the board for asking me to uh, present today, um, particularly Dr. Hawkins and uh, Carrie. Um, so let me start by, let's look at the definition of addiction. So the American Society of Addiction Medicine on the web link uh, below in the slide um, defines addiction as a chronic disease that involves, you know, brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. So all those come together. And it's not too much unlike other chronic illnesses and prevention efforts and treatment for addiction are generally as successful as those for other chronic diseases, such as diabetes, adult onset diabetes, COPD, ulcerative colitis, uh, multiple sclerosis, other chronic diseases involve genetics, brain circuits, environment, life experiences, and so forth. So addiction falls in there with other chronic diseases in many ways. In the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders published by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, the first DSM was published in 1952, and now we're on DSM-5, so the fifth edition came out a few years ago. So now addiction, which they call substance use disorders in the psychiatric world, is like other disorders in the DSM-5 uh, on a spectrum. So, you know, mild, moderate to severe. So if you look at the 11 criteria, for substance use disorders, you see that the last two, uh, tolerance and withdrawal, are the physical manifestations of addiction. So the majority here, one through nine, uh, are about loss of control. So things like tending to use the drug or alcohol in a longer, a more or longer period than planned, um, trying to quit or cut down and not being successful. Um, I won't go through them all, but you see a lot of these, including dangerous use, which we'll talk about more in a minute, which includes DUI, uh, driving under the influence, uh, is part of the syndrome. Physicians do have substance use disorders at about the same rate as everybody else. And there have been a number of large studies over the years that show that the lifetime prevalence of addiction for physicians is between 10 and 15 percent. So it's a very important uh, issue among physicians. Now, it's important, particularly for the non-physicians in the audience here, to realize lifetime prevalence means over the entire life of an average person, there is that risk that they will have an active substance use disorder. 
It doesn't mean, as some have misunderstood, that currently 10 to 15% of physicians are addicted. That's not the case. So point prevalence would be how many people currently have a problem with addiction, and that would be a much lower number, under 1%, probably even maybe 0.1%. It's not clearly known. But it's also important to realize that in these numbers, we're looking at all the spectrum from mild to um, through moderate to severe. And I, I did want to point out that the mild diagnosis is similar to what we used to call abuse, which is considered less likely to be a chronic uh, ongoing problem. So a lot of people that abuse alcohol or have mild substance use disorders, it's called now, uh, it's a transient thing. So it could be a college kid that's acting out and abuses or has a mild substance use disorder, and often that resolves itself. So it's estimated that about one in four people with mild substance use disorder go on to be moderate to severe. That's important, and we'll talk about that more in a sec. So um, physicians have substance use disorders. Um, denial is very prominent with really, really with all chronic illness. People don't want to have it and they don't want to face that they have it, particularly mental illness. And so physicians struggling with substance use disorders are often in denial. They're embarrassed, they're afraid, they're discouraged. They've often sought help uh, on their own because they are afraid of losing their career. And so they've tried to quit or moderate their use. Sometimes they seek treatment, um, you know, confidential treatment. And the problem is, is that without specialized treatment and particularly as with any chronic disease, long-term follow-up care and monitoring are vital to staying in remission. So that can be missed if it's not done properly. Eventually, if somebody has a, a type of substance use disorder that progresses, particularly the moderate to severe type, the symptoms will become prominent enough, you know, that, that people will notice and become concerned. So our goal should be to intervene before symptoms become advanced and workplace impairment occurs. Now we're talking about um, substance use disorders in physicians and in one large study, alcohol and opiates were, were the majority by far. So alcohol is the number one substance of abuse by our public in general and by physicians in particular. It's important to recognize that there's a difference between illness and impairment. So somebody can have any illness, particularly, I mean, it's any illness that can get severe enough, say, for example, even like the flu can be severe enough that the physician can become impaired and should not be working. Uh, other chronic illnesses that progress can, in the early phase, not cause impairment. Impairment means that the person should not be working because they're unable to work in, with skill and safety. So, but with, with chronic illnesses, you can have the illness and not be impaired. And then as it progresses, if it's not managed properly, it can cause impairment. So illness per se does not cause impairment, uh, does not constitute impairment. You can have illness without impairment, but when functional impairment exists, then treatment is, usually indicated and, and like I said, long-term monitoring to be sure the person stays safe. Um, with appropriate treatment, the person can have, the person that's had impairment can then shift so that they actually still have the illness but no longer have impairment. So what are the implications? Well, we know that substance use disorders can cause impairment, particularly when they're more advanced. Early intervention then is essential for patient safety. Early intervention increases patient safety and can preserve physicians' careers. 
medical boards in the United States and the Federation of State Medical Boards, see the reference below, have recognized this and created programs for education, early intervention, to get doctors evaluated and get them appropriate treatment and then long-term monitoring, which is what needs to happen for patient safety. In this recent 2020 guideline that was issued by the Federation of State Medical Boards, uh, they define the physician health program, which they recommend that every state medical board have such a program, um, which would be a confidential program for prevention, early detection, and intervention to get the doctor proper treatment and long-term monitoring from any potentially impairing condition. Uh, so many of the physician health programs not only look at things like addiction, but also chronic uh, mental health issues of other types or even physical health issues um, that can cause impairment. There are many. So I've been asked why is illegal or excessive substance use considered to be a violation of the Medical Practice Act? Well, there's definitely good reason, you know, addiction can cause impairment, as I said, depending on how severe it gets. And, you know, doctors resist getting care, so they need to be encouraged. And, you know, addiction is unseemly and often involves unethical behavior and society is generally appropriately concerned about addiction. I've been asked to address the issue of DUIs. So I believe DUIs are an important case finding opportunity. Uh, just, I can't help but divert a little and just talk about DUIs. Um, it's, it's the second most common crime in the United States. The CDC uh, does an annual uh, behavioral risk surveillance uh, of the United States population. And they predict they pre, they predicted over a hundred million um, self-reported episodes of alcohol impaired driving per year in the United States. A hundred over a hundred million episodes. Uh, the FBI shows that there have been typically over every year over about a million arrests for DUI. So that means that. Uh, is about there's about one per hundred so you have to drive impaired about a hundred times before you get a DUI uh, and there are about 10,000 or so people that are killed because of impaired driving which accounts for you know over a fourth of all traffic related deaths so DUI is an important topic um, 30% of DUIs are repeat offenders. So we definitely want to get involved with those people. So the critical issue with DUI is does the person have a substance use disorder? Um, I was also asked about uh, does the breath alcohol, so the BAC is the blood alcohol concentration, BRAC is the breath alcohol concentration. So they, they should be very similar. At the time of arrest, the level of the BAC or BRAC is related to the likelihood of an alcohol use disorder, roughly. So the higher the blood alcohol, the more likely, but not, not definitively, but more likely the person has a serious alcohol use disorder. By the way, California is in the lower half uh, of of the nation in terms of its rate of driving under the influence. So that we can feel good about 1.4 to 2% um, of, of drivers uh, in the past 30 days admit that they've had, you know, driving impairment from, from alcohol use. Uh, the UI conviction rates, it's an interesting subject. It looks like in California, roughly 79% of people that are arrested for DUI get convicted. There's a wide range though, depending on the county in California from 41 to 92%. It seems like in the report uh, referenced below, uh, the counties with the highest arrest rates have the lowest conviction rates. And there's a number of reasons for that that I won't go into, but um, that's just an important factor. So 
uh, as I'll mention in a minute, um, any doctor that's arrested for DUI, because DUI is a case finding event, every doctor arrested for DUI, first time DUIs in particular, they should be evaluated for a substance use disorder. We'll come back to that. The DSM, the DSM-4 transition to the DSM-5 changed the diagnostic criteria and fewer people now with a first time DUI actually meet criteria for substance use disorder. So in the past, in the DSM-4, you just had to have one symptom of alcohol problem, which it, with a DUI was you know, a legal problem. So, almost, so every person that had a DUI had a substance use disorder, but the majority were, were mild or were what they called the alcohol abuse. And uh, you know, the more serious, moderate to severe, which used to be called dependence, um, that rate has stayed about the same under the DSM-5. So what we see is under the DSM-5, there are fewer people diagnosed with the mild, which used to be called abuse level of alcohol uh, disorder. So, but the ones with more serious have stayed about the same. That, that's important um, because those with more severe use disorder, that's not just abuse or mild, uh, need definitely need intervention, treatment, long-term monitoring. Uh, in 2019, I did a survey of states to see how medical boards handled DUIs. Um, and what I found was that there's high variability. Some states are aggressive. Some states for first time DUIs seem almost unconcerned and do very little. Um, so my recommendation is that any physician that gets uh, the first DUI or particularly the first DUI should undergo as soon as possible after the DUI a screening evaluation by an alcoholism expert. And if there's concerns, then they should undergo further comprehensive evaluation when appropriate. And if somebody has a repeat DUI, if it's a second or third or more, then they definitely should undergo comprehensive evaluation. And if they're diagnosed with moderate or severe substance use disorder, then they definitely need treatment and long-term monitoring. So we have effective tools for treatment and monitoring. Early intervention and early evaluation are the most effective tools because we want to get to these people early. Treatment and specialized programs is important as I'll describe more in a sec. And monitoring is very effective. Um, in the second study listed here below, uh, where 904 physicians were followed uh, after five years of monitoring, it showed that there was actually no incident of patient harm. So once a doctor gets in monitoring and they've been identified and they're in monitoring, there's much less risk to patients. So with, with our modern monitoring and all these things we do, um, it's effective at reducing patient harm. Um, so what is the purpose of monitoring? It's to be sure that the individual uh, continues their treatment goals and their recovery. And any non-compliance uh, is followed by further evaluation, further treatment, or changing the monitoring or lengthening the monitoring. Um, Probation is really different than clinical monitoring. That's something that I think is important to recognize. So when somebody's on probation, that's a legal process. Now it involves monitoring, but it has much more serious consequences. So people on probation have trouble, for example, maintaining their specialty certification or getting a job, or they can even lose their profession. There's more stigma, the probation, issue is, is real. Being in monitoring, however, improves outcomes and helps people. So probation, even though it also involves monitoring and can help, has this additional stigma and problem. So if we're, if I was asked to comment on factors to consider in reducing 
the term of probation. So it's important, I think, to realize that addiction is a chronic illness. It is prone to recurrence. Um, but also we recognize that like physician health programs do not provide early termination monitoring. Just like, you know, if you're monitoring somebody with diabetes, you don't say, well, you've done well, let's stop monitoring. So the ideal thing is for people to stay in monitoring that have a chronic illness, they should stay in monitoring long-term, but it should be supportive and it documents their recovery. And uh, many of the physician health programs in the country, like the one I ran in Alabama, we offered ongoing monitoring following the required term of monitoring and many uh, accepted once they understood that it could be very helpful to them. To them. So, the board, I understand, no, I know that the board looks at other factors. So they look at other complaints and so forth, other than just the issue of substance use disorders. But the board can end probation, and the physician can be required to stay in a physician health program for ongoing monitoring, which is the is good because the physician will continue to be safe and l under less stress. The, the, the problem with probation is it really stresses doctors because of their difficulty finding jobs and keeping jobs and so forth and may increase the risk of relapse. So if they can stay in a supportive monitoring program where they're safe, it's ideal. So, if we're going to terminate monitoring at any point, whether it's probation or clinical monitoring, there's a bunch of things that need to be looked at. And I would encourage the board to encourage these things to happen if they're thinking of reducing the term of probation. So somebody needs to review their history, their recovery activities. What are they doing to maintain their recovery? Are they dealing with issues in their family and work? Um, are they in recovery? working with a sponsor or self-help group, uh, psych testing, including neuropsych testing should be done. That involves seeing a psychologist, a psychiatrist, somebody sh in that's doing the evaluation should call and talk to for people like the spouse, the work associates, the monitor, the sponsor. And I like to observe doctors in groups that to see how they interact and how are they doing in terms of facing their own problem and dealing with the recovery. And I asked them, what are their plans post probation? So all those things can be helpful in deciding whether to uh, let somebody off probation early or let somebody off monitoring early. Uh, so comprehensive evaluation, I think is really important. And I'm gonna encourage the board to use this more. So it can take several days but it involves a lot of things like a physical and labs, um, advanced drug testing um, with an addiction doc, a psychiatric assessment, psychological assessment with personality and neuropsych testing, and these other things that I've talked about. Um, sorry. Um, let's see, where was I? Okay, so I mentioned um, specialized treatment and it needs to be individualized. So instead of like being a, a time limited process of treatment, like many addiction programs are 30 days or 28 days, um, for professionals, it should be goal oriented. So we wanna see them exhibiting recovery behavior. We wanna deal with their co-occurring disorders, their family issues. So it, it could be a longer term of treatment and a lot of programs aren't oriented that way. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of addiction programs just have the same amount of time for everybody. So a professional's type treatment program should base their term of treatment on progress and not time. Um, but it's important to have a mix of professional and non-professional groups uh, and so forth. But the most important thing is good aftercare and monitoring. That's essential for success. So what I recommend to the board is to refer physicians, if there's a complaint involving a possible substance use disorder, the, the, the physician needs to be referred as soon as possible for an evaluation. And in most other states that I've worked with and 
you know, work closely with Alabama, but other boards, uh, they've utilized comprehensive evaluations more. And I think that in California, we could encourage the development of these more comprehensive, thorough evaluations. And in other states, like with, if somebody was sick with diabetes or COPD and they were having trouble at work, uh, they would be required to pay for their own evaluation and treatment. And I think the wards that I work with uh, tend to require the doctor to pay for their own evaluations uh, and to get them promptly. And if they don't get them as requested, the boards often consider that unprofessional conduct. So, uh, for example, in Alabama, if a doctor is required, asked to go for an evaluation and they refuse that, they've made that uh, um, fall under unprofessional conduct. And so doctors tend to comply. Um, and I know California is soon hopefully going to have a physician health program, and that program needs to provide education, early case finding, uh, and all these other things. There can be great benefits to having a PHP, uh, as I mentioned. Um, but one of the greatest is the PHP can act fast because it's clinical. So if there's symptoms of addiction, the PHP can intervene and require a doctor to go for evaluation. And if they refuse, they can be referred to the board. Uh, most doctors comply because they don't want to be uh, involved in the legal process with the medical board. So we have an extremely high rate of compliance uh, under a PHP. So it's much faster uh, and therefore much safer, I believe. I was asked to comment on preventive measures and we definitely need improvement in curriculum and addiction in general in medical schools and in particular also addiction among colleagues and professionals. Uh, I believe we ought to encourage and some some universities have um, you know, divisions or departments of addiction medicine so that there are faculty for consultation and so forth. Um, the PHP can help with that, educating uh, at the med schools, including students and orientation for new residents. I gave lectures every year when I was the PHP director for new residents and it helped them understand what would happen if they have problems and how to seek help early. So, Finally, um, more information at the center I work at, we put together blogs and webinars that are at that website, centerprofessionalrecovery.com. Um, and there's a bunch of topics that might be of interest to further delve into this. I did a two-part series on DUI that went into much more depth about DUIs down below, second from the bottom. Thank you very much. I can accept questions. Thank you, Dr. Skipper. Are there any questions from board members? Jim Helzer, um, Dr. Skipper, could you compare the physician health program you're discussing to the medical board's former diversion program? Yes. Um, so there's a number of differences. Uh, the most common physician health program now is situated um, as a nonprofit that's often supported in part by the board and by the medical association and others, but it's not directly a board program. So uh, that fact encourages doctors to come forward more when they can go to a physician health program that's independent and, and non-punitive. Um, also, I think real important is for the physician health program to have a physician leader that can do the education, early intervention, and so forth. And the former diversion program had um, you know, members of the of the diversion evaluation committees, but not an active uh, employee that would be the head of the physician health program. So I think that's important. Uh, those are the two most important factors, uh, I believe. Thank you. Hey, hey, Dr. Skipper, this is Ryan Brooks. Uh, first, uh, absolutely fantastic presentation. So thank you very much. You know, You're welcome. areas I'd like to look at or question is 
on identifying those individuals, those doctors who have a predisposition for alcoholism or drug abuse. As we know, you know, it's a disease. There are certain factors, familiar environmental that you've mentioned in your presentation. Is there a way that we can maybe have a questionnaire of a doctor's history prior, you know, an ongoing questionnaire to determine if someone is in a high risk category, medium risk category, or low risk category? As a patient would walk in who's a obese, 300 pounds, the first thing you're going to say, that person probably has a high risk for diabetes, right? You yep. know, alcoholism and drug abuse aren't the same. You can't necessarily see it when someone walks in the door. And uh, are there programs out there where we can identify those high risk individuals prior to them, you know, becoming a challenge? I think in the clinical situation, uh, there are several tools, um, questionnaires that are, can be very effective for early identification. Um, you know, in in my practice in the past, I've just included uh, the CAGE questions, for example, the C-A-G-E, the uh, have you ever tried to cut down or quit? Um, has anybody been annoyed by your use? Uh, do you feel like you have to hide your drinking or do you feel guilty about drinking or drug use? And uh, have you had uh, withdrawal symptoms or you know need an eye opener? That's the E. Um, it's amazing how many people in a clinical situation with a doctor will admit some of those things. There are other survey questions. One of the most uh, uh, predictive uh, factors that determine whether somebody might develop an addiction is family history. It, it does seem to you know be more common. So asking, is there a family history? Um, now, you know whether that can be done in the licensing setting is questionable. So in the licensing setting, I think asking about previous problems, previous treatment, previous legal issues, that's what's done now. And I think those things are uh, predictive and, and the board has appropriately been concerned when somebody has a past history. But in the clinical setting, I think there are other things to do to look at that. So uh, thank you very much, but I'm not necessarily talking about in the clinical setting. I'm talking more about an ongoing you know, quality of care for our doctors who are under you know, tremendous you know, pressure and stress and you know, may have the family history you know, that you just mentioned. I mean, how right. could it be a program you know, that the medical profession takes on to say, you know what, this is real. Um, we're gonna evaluate you every two or three months or whatever that magic time is and yeah. we identify, you know a potential high risk individual you know let's get them care before it becomes a dui before it comes a death or it becomes a, a problem why wouldn't that be the gold standard for the medical profession yeah you know it's been looked at to see if psych testing can predict uh addiction and that's been not successful uh, all kinds of personalities tend to have a problem with addiction I think what we'd be looking for is education regarding these symptoms that, that are listed by the DSM-5 and, you know, creating an environment where, if possible, where people can actually confidentially seek help without punishment. That would be maybe the earliest way to get at people. It's, it's really hard to predict otherwise. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Hawkins. Sorry, I have a question for Dr. Skipper. Oh. Dr. Skipper, thank you very much. It's a it's a wonderful presentation, and this board still struggles with figuring out the correct pathway in terms of dealing with with this and related problems. Uh, to that extent, uh, I've enjoyed that uh, we all share what I call the American experiment, and that is to say that each state has its own rules and regulations and and governance. And I know you've been a consultant for for many state boards. Can you point to one state or a couple of states that you think have uh, an ideal program that we should study as a model? Yes, um, there is a high variation around the country of effectiveness, I think. Um, and by the way, the Federation of State Physician Health Programs, which I'm on the committee, is looking at accrediting physician health programs. So they're developing 
criteria that will pinpoint or identify the, the best programs. Uh, I would say Washington State has a very highly thought of program that's the board there is very happy with their program. I think Colorado has a great program. Uh, and, you know, there are other states, 10 or 12 other states I can mention, but those are on the West Coast that I think are highly effective. And I could tell you why if, if we wanted to spend more time on it, but sure. they, they are good programs. And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that the physician health program really is uh, is two edged. And that is to say that medical boards are principally charged with protection of the public. Uh, but we also are charged with uh, rehabilitation of physicians. Uh, and unfortunately, because of the threat of loss of licensure, uh, physicians go underground. Uh, they hide their substance abuse problems. Uh, worse yet, they hide their uh, depression. Uh, and I practice in a community where in the space of 18 months, four female physicians committed suicide because they were hiding their, their depression. Um, so we want physicians to come forward, uh, but we need for them to come forward in a fashion that both protects the public and allows for their rehabilitation. Uh, the medical board regularly looks at DUIs, but we need to have some mechanism of identifying physicians and helping physicians and protecting the public before there's a DUI. Uh, and that's what we're working toward. Thank you for your help. Thank you. I, I do want to point out that I believe that helping physicians be healthier, identifying chronic illness early and getting physicians help does protect the public. They're not mutually exclusive. So we can, it helps to help physicians, helps patient safety. And that's often seems like it's been disconnected. Like we, you know, we don't help physicians. The board really can help patients by helping physicians. So I think they're, they're like you said, they're important, both. Thank you. Dr. you can ask a question? Doctor, you can ask a question. Yes, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Doctor Stewart. Thank you for the presentation. I was going to ask: uh, Is there any uh, ongoing collaboration between the state board, your organization, to start this reach out education and information start from day one in medical school and residency training program? Because it's a chronic disease. These this start when they're young, not. We want to reach out and start the job before they become a problem after graduation. We're seeing more and more physicians who in residency training fellowship they in the trouble, even after one drink or one the binge and weekend. Uh, you see any state board or federal state board or experience that this effort should start way early? Thank you. Yes. Um, you know. The most common drug of abuse by physicians is alcohol and the natural history of alcoholism is that it tends to take about 20 years to come to full severe fruition. So we do see symptoms earlier, often in the teens and 20s, but it doesn't often come to a crisis until the 40s, unlike some other drugs that are faster <clears throat> or shorter uh, natural history. So I think it is important to do early education, early case finding. And I think the physician health program that you're planning to create should be uh, tasked with going to medical schools and providing information about this, encouraging people to come forward, or even colleagues to refer someone. I think that's often the most common thing I've seen in a, in a very effective physician health program you're going to see people referring colleagues earlier because they want them to get help. You know, if they think they're going to be punished, they're going to be hesitant to refer somebody. But uh, if they care, you know, they often will comment to a colleague. I think you might have a problem with drinking. Don't you want to get some help? But if the colleague doesn't do that, which often is the case because of fear, um, then they could call and, and ask for help. So I think a good physician health program could be almost, um, you know, uh, 
monitored for how often there are early referrals. That would be the best best thing to happen. Dr. Hawkins, may I ask a question? No. Uh, Please go ahead. Thank you. And thank you very much, Dr. Skipper, for accepting our offer to educate us. Uh, I lost my connection. Hopefully my question will not be repetitive. Um, and I agree with prevention as treatment. So thank you for the questioner and, and your response, particularly in our uh, undergrad medical students and residency training program. My question it really in, involves what we have to do on the panels. Um, very often uh, the person comes to us because they have a DUI or they're an anesthesiologist and they're using uh, drugs. Uh, and the latter, usually we know it impacts patient care, anesthesiologists under the influence. Someone discovers them in, a, in, a, in an area and they're knocked out. So we very often have to say, is this a substance abusing licensee? And you gave us some clues with the DSM about how we should approach that. We are constantly, because the physicians want to be able to practice and don't want limitations, want to convince someone and ultimately us that they are not a uh, substance abusing licensee and therefore not subject to the uniform standards. Can you talk about a bit? And if Carrie, if Carrie have to put some in there, that'd be fine too. But can you talk a little about that? I think we have to be careful about making sure the public has enough time to ask questions that may be somewhat different from what the, the board's asking, although not you know, less important. Yes, I think that, you know, in my experience, uh, as a physician health program director, when I went and confronted somebody that is showing, you know, maybe they've been found uh, unconscious in the operating room or wherever, um, you know, or following a DUI or whatever the symptoms are, that if the program can be fashioned so that it is firm but supportive, you know, doctors actually want help. They're just afraid to get it. And, and so the the clinical physician health program can be very useful to the board because it's that intermediate touch where you're saying, if you don't get help, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. And if they sign an agreement to stop practice, get treatment, get long-term monitoring, it sort of paves the way for that to be less of a battle. And I can say that in my interventions of physicians over the years, and I've intervened on thousands in my career, um, they actually want help. They're just afraid. And they've often tried on their own over and over. I've seen many anesthesiologists, for example, who they, they know they shouldn't be using the drugs and they've tried to quit, but they have this disease and so it progresses. So we want to get to them as early as possible before there's patient harm. We don't want to wait until it's severe. We don't want to create an atmosphere where they go underground and get moved around from surgical center to surgical center, losing their jobs and so forth. We want them to get help early. This is TJ Watkins. I have a question. Dr. Skipper, thank you so much. We've been waiting two years to hear an expert speak about this issue. So I'm very grateful that you're here. Right now, our board does not have a PHP program in place. So we have to make do with what we've got. And I think, you know, we get around DUIs. I don't know what the percentage are, but we get it frequently. And um, in preparation for this, I kind of charted the most common we, we get. So we have circumstances that is at the medium level where we are focused with a doctor showing up with multiple DUIs that have you know, vehicular incidents while under the influence, and they come up at, you say, above 0 0.20 on both occasions. And, you know, so common sense tells you, oh, this is looking really bad. There's something wrong. However, they go to one expert, and that one expert gives us a clean bowl of health that says, you know, there's not an alcohol use disorder present whatever and it kind of defies your common sense and i know it's not about common sense it's about the dsm5 you know criteria i just and then you mentioned in the presentation a more extensive list of how to evaluate which i love honestly so how much reliance right now i just need tools 
to can we uh, place on such a the one kind of interpretation of someone's condition in the environment that we are the board and they desperately trying to save their license, which is understandable. But at the same time, we want to make sure that this doctor is not just safe to practice, but also getting the required help. If they walk away with a public reprimand for this, then they'll, they'll, they'll get worse if we are in the second DUI. And I'm just always frustrated by that. And I'm looking at you as the expert for some guidance on that. Thank you. Well, that's very, I think that's very significant. And I see that a lot myself that when we get referred somebody, they've had other evaluations. So I think that, as I said, I really think that the board, most, a lot of boards that I've consulted with and been involved with have actually developed um, criteria for what they want to see in an evaluation. And if we had a PHP, that PHP would have those criteria. You know, we're, we're not going to accept an evaluation from someone unless they've done all these things. And having more than one professional involved is helpful as well, because I know uh, I've met with people and sort of been hoodwinked because they, you know, present this in their own way to try to avoid detection. And if we have uh, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, an addiction doc working together, we're much more apt to get a thorough, accurate evaluation. And that's such a critical step. So I would, I would encourage the board to do what other boards have done. And that is have a list of evaluation programs. And, and I'm not saying that because I run one. We're, our program is very small and we're not in need of further business, but it would be good for the board to develop criteria of what they wanna see with an evaluation and promulgate that information and and see if more programs can be developed and use those identified programs because they're much more thorough and much more accurate in my opinion thank you board, me board members are we comfortable moving to public comment or do other board members have questions i just have one quick question um please mr rue uh, i want to thank dr skipper for the wonderful presentation as well as the recommendations and suggestions actually this question is more for staff um, can, what is our current protocol when it comes to a DUI, uh, case, um, and how much and, or how much of, um, Dr. Skipper's recommendations are we, do we have in place already? I'm happy to assist with that. Um, first of all, uh, the board has authorized the physician health and wellness program to be developed and that uh, language it's a it's a large regulatory package it is at its second level of review at the department of consumer affairs so that is making progress um, with regard to addressing excessive use of drugs or alcohol that is covered under uh, business and professions code section 2239 and um, the board can take action if drugs or alcohol are used to the extent or in such a manner as to be dangerous or injurious to the licensee or to anyone else or to the extent that it impairs the ability of the licensee to practice medicine safely or more than one misdemeanor or any felony involving the use of alcohol or drugs. So um, what that language contemplates is that it, it, th this is why you'll, you'll see a one-time DUI come before the board if there is a high blood alcohol level or um, something that occurred, like an actual collision, uh, injuries, property damage, yes. um, because the legislature has put in there this contemplation that there be more than one misdemeanor conviction or one, or at least one felony. So, one DUI that doesn't have other factors 
may not come before the board for discipline. And that's that's a statutory issue. Um, now, I think what Dr. Skipper's point is um, that with a physician health and wellness program, that person uh, may be referred. If it comes to the board's attention, it'll be looked at from the enforcement perspective, but they could self refer or be referred by their program for evaluation. And with the uniform standards uh, being part of this physician health and wellness program, it is not a diversion program. And so if they are fully compliant, then it won't come to the board's attention. If they have a positive test or commit a major or minor violation, you know, not be cooperative, not going to their group meetings, et cetera, missing a test that gets referred to the board, they start their enforcement process. Um, so those are some tools being developed and tools that are, are in our code right now. Dr. Mambo, can I make, can I make a quick comment? <laughs> So let's go to Dr. Skipper first, yes, and we'll come course. back to Dr. Mahmood. Yes, yes. Dr. Skipper, go ahead. So, you know, I I would encourage the board to look at um, referring people as soon as possible and almost immediately after any complaint or awareness that a doctor's had a DUI, and not wait till there's been a thorough investigation. In other words, a complaint about substance use or a DUI is a symptom and it should be evaluated clinically. So I think sending that person for an evaluation right away, rather than having to wait for the time of the, you know, thorough uh, investigation by investigators is, is, would be good. And that way we can get help for somebody earlier. And I think that would be effective. Madam Chair, quick follow up. Please. Uh, Actually, that's exactly what I was going to ask Carrie. Um, uh, for a DUI, anyone who comes to the comes to the board or comes to the commission on a DUI is an evaluation automatic, and if not, um, a, a comprehensive evaluation, as Dr. Skipper talked about. And if not, how can our board try to make that a um, a, a mandatory requirement? How will we go about doing that? Oh uh, well. We may need some legislative help, but that this will take a, a I, I don't want to answer without giving it due consideration to see what tools we already have. Um, I think there needs to be a policy directive because some of these cases, um, even with what may be considered a, a high blood alcohol level, uh, it might go to hearing before an administrative law judge who dismisses the case and then that may get adopted by a panel. And so there needs to be a clear policy directive about how uh, the board wants a one time DUI case handled and um, there needs to be a, a review of what evaluation tools are available now. We have business and professions code section 820, where the board can request that this person undergo an evaluation. Um, and many physicians are agreeable to do it voluntarily. Otherwise, there may need to be a petition to compel the evaluation. Um, and that has to be uh, go through a hearing. Um, and approved by the board. So there's multiple steps involved, but I think you know these are good questions to take a look at the tools that are available and and present those to you to see uh, what changes you want, if any, um, and what needs to be added through legislative or regulatory methods. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow up with the chair and, and, and the staff offline. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahmood. Yes, thank, uh, that's good. Well, thank you. Such a wonderful presentation and you can see the interest and excitement in here. This is such an important issue. Uh, substance abuse and uh, 
uh, uh, alcohol problem is really a major issue in medical profession. So I want you to bring to a different point and there might be a thing or not. And um, are those people who have some kind of evidence, are they are, have been under DUI or other problems with substance or drug abuse or alcohol abuse? Um, have anybody, has anybody worked on people who work in specialties? Like we put them on probation, we took them, okay, we'll monitor them, but take those privileges for a certain period of time, like somebody is pulmonologist cannot work in ICU, a cardiologist cannot perform um, angioplasty, or a surgeon cannot go to OR because these are life saving measures and we put them on kind of probation, just watch them, but they are under bigger danger and public is really not safe under the hands of those people who we're just monitoring and watching and they just go in and do all those things, just somebody's watching, nobody knows. Uh, their tolerance for the alcohol or the drugs is so high that up to a certain extent, nobody even would be able to observe that until somebody do the test. And there are periodic testing. Um, but has any board worked on that? That on the focus of those physicians who are working in specialty work, especially life cycle measures, to take those privileges in those situations until we are 100% sure that person is off that problem. And if not, is there any pilot program can be done anywhere? Or maybe California can be the pioneer on that. Well, I can say that when we treat uh, someone, they are the people who refer that patient um, expect us to uh, delineate the aftercare, and that often involves, you know, part-time practice for a while, gradual resumption of activities under supervision and monitoring. So I think the clinical program that you know, treats the person, gets to know them and knows their disease and their illness and how it's manifested uh, can be part of deciding and helping the board know if there should be restrictions. You know, for example, if there's cognitive impairment, you know, a person should not be uh, resuming practice if it's significant. And if there's, you know, uh, tremor, that kind of thing, because of an alcohol problem, then there should be time and reassessment later. So again, it's a clinical issue, and I think it can be determined and uh, can be accurate. Thank you. Thank you. All right, are there additional questions or I'd like to open it up for public comment? All right, seeing none at this time, Sean, if you could open the line for public comment. Okay, we've activated the hand raising and Q&A feature. Anyone who'd like to make a public comment, please uh, indicate so now. First up here, we have Rosie, Rosie Arthur's daughter. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. I had difficulty um, accessing today. I guess it was bandwidth problems. So I don't know. Did I miss the uh, uh, part uh, at number 18 public comments or has that been deferred to a later time? Yes, we're on item 19 on the agenda. Okay. The presentation on uh, a substance abuse presentation. All right. Yes. Okay. I have a comment on this, but I wasn't able to do the other. So at some point in time, can I do my comments for number 18 out of order since there was no access at that point for me to get no, into? No, we're past that agenda item. So if you could please I make your comments on agenda item 19. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I've had some experience uh, working with people with uh, in diversion programs on a professional level. And one of the things that you do see is for every DUI you catch, there are numerous ones, you know, maybe even 100 that they don't catch. So when you catch one, just one, there's usually another problem there. Um, oftentimes, patients, uh, professionals who are in these diversion programs find safe havens during that process, like uh, doing utilization review, independent medical review, and they don't tell you. Oftentimes when uh, they come and say that they are self-referring themselves, you need to check for litigation because what you'll find is they'll have lawsuits against them and as a part of their confidential settlement agreements is for them to enter into this program. So. By the time you get them referred one way or the other, there's oftentimes some history behind it 
And you need to be aware of that as you're defining these uh, exceptions to the rule and how it's managed and even uh, monitoring compliance. I mean, uh, it would seem simple to, you know, check the court records to see if they have litigation that may have spurned them into coming forward voluntarily. Um, these are some of the hazards of the program. And um, so that's the big thing that uh, I see as a problem is that usually when they, they make it to your program, there are a number of problems that they aren't going to tell you voluntarily. I mean, it's very seldom that somebody has one and only DUI, say, or they will have a history of mental okay, problems. Okay, they may have cognitive problems that they're not aware of. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Eric Andrews. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. First of all, Howard, NBC is not charged with the rehabilitation of physician. That's not a correct interpretation of the law, and you've been told this before. Why are you so defiant on this? You can only consider rehabilitation if it's in the best interest of patient safety. You can't rehabilitate a doctor just because you want to. You need to stop misquoting the law. BPC 2229 says, quote, where rehabilitation and protection are inconsistent, protection shall be paramount, close quote. Second, the Feder Federation of State Medical Boards is not a trustworthy organization as they have come under fire for their affiliation with pharmaceutical companies. The Senate Finance Committee has been investigating its close ties between pharmaceutical companies and the FSMB. Third, why do doctors need the medical board to provide them a program for addiction? The board is a licensing agency whose main purpose is to protect patients. This board falls under the auspices of the Department of Consumer Affairs, not the Department of Licensee Affairs. The only concern this board should have regarding addicted doctors is how to protect consumers from them and to discipline them should they screw up. It's not this board's job to be concerned about providing or monitoring an addiction program for doctors. If you can't even protect consumers properly, why the hell are you trying to protect addicted doctors? There's tons of good, hardworking people in this country with addiction problems who don't have a licensing agency to protect them with help. I'm a notary public. The state Secretary of State licenses us. They don't provide us with an addiction program if we need help. Doctors of all people should be able to get their own help. Having said that, the CMA seems to want to stick their big hoo-ha everywhere and protect California's doctors, even though two-thirds of the doctors in the state refuse to join their little club. So why doesn't the CMA have an addiction program for doctors where there would be no question of it being used for any kind of diversion or bargaining away discipline? Let the CMA provide doctors with an addiction program. They have plenty of money. Contractors in the Contractor State License Board, which is also under the Department of Consumer Affairs, they don't get an addiction program, so why should doctors? Do you want someone building your house incorrectly because they're high on drugs? Contractors have to get help all by themselves. I think doctors can too. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Michelle, are you there? Yes, I am. Please go ahead. I am Michelle Montserrat Ramos, and I'm with Consumer Watchdog. There are a number of new members on this board who do not know that the issue I've spent most of my time working on is linked to substance abusing physicians. Why? Well, my husband to be Lloyd Montserrat died at the hands of a substance abusing physician. There were other victims besides Lloyd. The problem is that we did not have the right to know that his surgeon had a problem with an addiction to crack cocaine. Why? Because we had a confidential diversion program or what you now call a confidential physician health and wellness program. The only way I, find, I found out about Lloyd's doctor's addiction to crack cocaine is by reviewing his long arrest record, which included felony possession of crack cocaine and prostitution. Lloyd was a well-respected Latino political leader in this state. He made real change for our communities. Ask our Health and Human Services Secretary, Javier Becerra, about how Lloyd helped him. Ask our U.S. Senator, Alex Padilla, who Lloyd Montserrat was. Ask the mayor of Los Angeles who Lloyd was. I could go on and on, but I won't. Since this board would not investigate Lloyd's case, I was forced to work on policy issues like the termination of the confidential diversion program, which the medical board agreed 
at that time was putting patients at risk. I was forced to work on legislation like the uniform standards. The uniform standards for the evaluation, monitoring, and discipline of substance abusing healthcare professionals in this state addresses the issues that the confidential program would not. There are minor and major violations that provide consumer protection that the confidential programs did not provide. I know that this is about the movement to remove the uniform standards, but you cannot do that. The uniform standards are one of the few consumer protections that we do have. All of you on panels will recognize that substance abuse brings the doctors back to the panels, but there's also patient harm and other issues linked to the case. You cannot compare addiction to diabetes or cancer or COPD. You choose addiction, you do not choose cancer. If the substance abusing doctors really wanted to help themselves, rid themselves of their addictions for not only their patients, but for themselves and their families, then they would not have an issue with a non-confidential program and they would certainly support the uniform standards because they would realize that the uniform standards are in place to protect the physician as well as consumers. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Lori Govar. Lori, are you there? I am here. Thank you so much. I am uh, just primarily wanting to just thank the board for taking this time. I am the director of the monitoring department at IBH Solutions. Um, we are headquartered right here in Irvine, California. We provide monitoring services like those Dr. Skipper's been providing for the medical board in neighboring Oregon, as well as in Delaware. Um, and, and to respond to a one of the comments made earlier, we also provide those services for all the licensed folks in the state of Delaware, including notary republics. Um, so anyway, I wanted to thank the board for taking this time since it's such an important topic for our California medical professionals, as well as for the public. We firmly believe that with the right support and structure, medical professionals diagnosed with substance use disorders and mental health disorders can practice safely. We daily walk that tightrope of ensuring public safety while supporting our participating licensees. Um, I'd like to underline the importance of that initial evaluation that has been described, as well as early intervention that is, um, can be done through outreach, both to the residency programs, as well as to the public um, and educating the professional, the medical professionals themselves so that they can self screen and try to get, try to get them to that help earlier. Um, it, it, research has shown over the years that early intervention is really the way to go, both for public safety, but also for long-term outcomes. When we began our work in Oregon, the public was angry that their safety had not been well protected by prior programs. We worked closely with the associations, the boards, the residency programs, and all the other stakeholders to first create and then deliver a program that does have the public's trust. I know that's something that's going to be important for you in California as well. Um, so just wanted to, again, thank you. And if we can be of any assistance as you work on your program, uh, let us know since we are here in your state and working in Oregon as well. Thank you for your public comment. Next up, we have Marion Hollingsworth. Marion, are you there? I am, can you hear me? I can, please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Marion Hollingsworth. A few questions regarding this presentation on doctor addiction that I hope can be answered. Dr. Skipper said there was no incident of patient harm among so-called rehabilitated doctors. Did I get that right? Should there be an asterisk next to that incident statement adding that has been reported? Because reporting on harm is sketchy at best at most hospitals or medical groups. So my question is, who was asked whether there was patient harm? It's important to put that in context. Also regarding GUIs with a physician health program, will that make the medical board less likely to discipline or will a DOI conviction still go through the usual disciplinary process? I know Carrie did touch on this earlier somewhat. So if a simple DOI with no harm involved to anyone, will that case be reviewed? Um, Carrie Webb said one DOI with no other factors may not come before the board, but will having a physician health program impact that decision? Will the program make them more likely to be lenient and would a minor DUI result in a confidential letter? Thank you. I hope you can answer this. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Virginia Farr. Virginia, are you there? Hi, I thought this um, was interesting. 
and I agree patient safety should come first, but also I found it interesting that nothing about trauma was mentioned when most, a lot of the alcohol is based in people with trauma and that wasn't discussed. Um, medical schools aren't taught in trauma. It wasn't until 2016 that psychologists was required to be trained in trauma. So we have a very traumatic, populate, traumatized population and we don't have enough people trained in trauma. And these programs you're talking about, a lot of them will not deal with the trauma at the level that it needs to be dealt with. It does a bottom, a top up program instead of bottom up, which works with the brain instead of the body and trauma stored in the body. And a lot of people, times people can't talk about trauma, yet you guys, or trauma is treated through talking in most places when it needs to be worked with the body. Um, I think all doctors it should be required can, um, education units on trauma the proper way. So they know about trauma for themselves and their patients and how it's related to alcohol and substance abuse. And how like, and how childhood trauma is related to that. Because most doctors have toxic stress they're from ground up. They are pushed to go to medical school, which is has a lot of trauma. Medical school has a lot of trauma. The hours of medical schools, a lot of trauma. And then you've pushed into a system with structures that cause a lot of trauma. And we don't have the structures in place to deal with that trauma. So a very thorough, very correct um, trauma therapy program to me would be foundational in anything that dealt with substance abuse or mental health or depression. And you say people died of depression, they most likely died of trauma, not depression. Trauma is probably the underlying thing of it. And they probably didn't know how to heal their trauma because not enough people are trained in it. So that's the route you should be looking at, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any additional requests in queue. Thank you, Sean. We'll bring it back to the board. Are there any um, additional questions or uh, comments, Dr. Skipper or otherwise? Alejandra, I have one. May I? Please, please go ahead. Um, Mr. Skipper said something that I thought was a really critical piece of it, which was his recommendation that a psychiatrist, psychologist, and addiction expert um, be a part of the evaluation. And I know that right now we have medical experts who are giving their opinions on whether or not there is an addiction, but this seems again like a recommendation that would help us really understand how we can best identify the doctors that may be a threat to patient safety. So I guess this question is more for staff. How do we go about in the process making sure that we have actual addiction specialists in the way that um, Mr. Skipper recommended be a part of that evaluation? I think this is something that I would feel more comfortable if you will uh, allow Ms. Campo Verdi to uh, go back and talk with enforcement staff and maybe have a, a presentation or a report back to the board about the tools that are currently in place. And then uh, we can get direction from the board on whether you want changes to that and how we need to go about getting additional tools if necessary in place. Okay, great. Well, then I'll, I'll make that um, request for that presentation for our next meeting. Yeah, and uh, to staff, perhaps we can work together, uh, you know, when we do our agenda reviews uh, and preparation to make sure that we come back with answers to some of these questions. Um, and, you know, think critically about how we can um, add some of these recommendations uh, whether it's to the regulations on the physician health and wellness program or uh, use existing tools um, to make sure that we're advancing that uh, patient safety objective. Are there other uh, questions, comments? All right, hearing none. Uh, thank you, Dr. Skipper, for joining us today. We really appreciated uh, your time and your presentation. Um, and thank you to staff. Uh, for working behind the scenes to organize that presentation. We will move on now to agenda item 20, which is discussion and possible action on legislation and regulations. And Mr. Bone, you are up for this one. Thank you, Madam President. 
Nice to back before you all. Good morning, members. Um, in looking at the tracker list, which is the um, document in your board packet, with which has blue and green uh, background on it, um, the items in blue are items where uh, bills that are where no discussion is required. This is because each bill has either not been amended since the board adopted its position, or it was a two year bill now, or is no longer related to the mission of the medical board, which is the case uh, with one of those. So, with the permission of you, Madam President of the board, um, I propose we skip a discussion of AB 356, 562, 1102, and SB 4857, and SB 528. So, sorry, go ahead. So I couldn't, I, I couldn't get myself off mute there. Sorry about no that. No problem. So, hearing no objection, I'll move on to Assembly Bill 359. Uh, a revised analysis of the bill was distributed to the members earlier this week. I uh, appreciate your the members' patience. Sometimes things come kind of fast and furious during the final weeks of the legislative session. Um, that analysis reflects amendments uh, that are not yet in the bill, but that the author has committed to taking. Uh, the author is asking the board to consider the bill in light of those proposed amendments, which are attached to um, this analysis. As proposed, the bill now uh, would simply clarify with regard to USMLE and testing that the existing pathways to licensure are available to licensees who require more than four attempts to pass step three of the United States Medical Licensing Examination. The proposed amendment, I expect, may clear up any misunderstanding that exists surrounding those pathways to licensure available to this group of physicians, again, who have required more than four attempts to pass step three. Uh, the details of those pathways, those existing pathways, are discussed in the analysis. The second portion of the bill relates to continuing medical education, or CME, and the bill expands the types of courses that a physician may take to meet their CME requirement. In a recent amendment, the author agreed to limit the amount of total allowable CME credit to no more than 30% of the total requirement. The recent amendments seem to reflect the board's consideration during the May meeting as there was a discussion from some of the members about putting a cap on those uh, on those hours, which is now in the bill. Further, the proposed amendments, which again are attached to the back of the analysis, uh, appear to address the board's concerns surrounding the USMLE provisions. And we had a lot of discussion about that at the, board, at the May meeting. Therefore, uh, the board may wish to consider adopting an opposed unless amended position on the current version of the bill contingent upon the proposed amendments going into print. Once amended, then the board's position would change automatically to neutral. It's a little convoluted, so happy to kind of talk through that. Um, Madam President, I'll turn it back to the board for discussion or questions. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Krause. We have a second. Second. All right, we've got a motion to approve the staff recommendation from Dr. Krause and a second from Dr. Gananadev. Are there questions or comments from board members? Uh, I think we were opposed before, uh, as uh, our staff explained that I think uh, the changes, actually the proposed changes make it, uh, it will come to support. So thank you. Agree. Additional Just comments or questions? All right, hearing none, let's uh, go to public comment, please. We've activated the public or the hand raising functionality in the Q and A window for anyone who'd like to make a public comment. Please indicate so now. And First just for we... yeah, for clarification, I just want to note uh, that public comments should be focused on AB three fifty nine, physicians and surgeons licensure and examination. First up, we have Roxanne Gold. Roxanne, are you there? I am. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. First, I'd like to compliment your staff member, Aaron Brown Bone. He's been extremely professional, responsive, thorough, even when he was communicating opposition to AB 359. Um, it was a pleasure to interact with him. So I want to be clear that I know the amendments that you're um, are being proposed. We are not, I'm representing Choice Medical Group. We are not opposed to those amendments. We're actually a co-sponsor of the bill. But since there wasn't anyone at the your board meeting to explain 
uh, what the real intent and purpose of AB 359 was and is, I wanted to provide a little bit of background. Um, since 2004, out-of-state doctors of osteopathy who have a license in good standing have been allowed to practice in California without the current four-year requirement that applies to out-of-state MDs. AB 359 was introduced to address the greater need for healthcare access by providing out-of-state MDs with reciprocity and applying the standards that apply to DOs to MDs. It, the bill made it out of the Assembly on consent and out of the Senate Business and Professions Committee 14-0 when concerns were raised. Um, and so the last thing the authors and sponsors want is for inexperienced physicians practicing in California. So I mean, as a result, I mean, you have amendments that um, are before you, but we have proposed amendments that we think could be a middle ground and provide that physicians are tr truly uh, trained and um, are not exposing Californians to undue uh, negative treatment, I suppose. The amendments are relatively simple. They would have to have satisfactorily completed a minimum of four years of board approved postgraduate training, which must include graduating from a postgraduate training program of at least 36 months in duration. They are eligible for, for or certified by a specialty board approved by the American Board of Medical Specialties and that they hold an unlimited and unrestricted license as a physician and surgeon in another state and has held that license continuously for a minimum of two years prior to the date of application. It's significantly more than DOs are currently um, required, but we think it would um, ensure that physicians practicing in California from out of state are in fact trained and have had patient on uh, hands on patient care that would sufficiently um, allow them to practice in California. Thank you for allowing me to provide uh, the purpose and the input of the bill. And unfortunately, that wasn't provided at your last board meeting. And I think in a way that negatively impacted the outcome uh, because you were not informed of what we were actually trying to accomplish. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Adrian Muhammad. Adrian, are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can everyone hear me? We can. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time. I'll try and keep this brief, as I think Aaron did a wonderful job explaining um, the proposed changes to um, AB 359. And so, um, just generally, as he had stated previously, we wanted to make sure that we weren't creating any um, possibilities where um, physicians who have not demonstrated that they are safe and capable physicians from out of state are coming here. Um, and so with these amendments, what we try to make sure is that um, that does all loops back to what is current law in terms of reciprocity, because those are proven pathways that have been shown to be safe and effective for protecting Californians. And so we just wanted to make sure that um, it's all consistent. And I do believe that these proposed amendments do maintain that consistency and um, absolutely support the medical board's goals of protecting patients. And um, and additionally, the um, we we uh, did put a cap on the amount of CME for these uh, practice management courses, and we we actually worked with Aaron on that and the staff, and we really appreciate um, we really appreciate all of your help going back and forth on this, trying to work this out. And so, thank you all. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next, we have Rosie Arthurstein. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, regarding the osteopathic board, uh, your text here doesn't make any mention. Uh, what is the hierarchical arrangement? Uh, is this being considered by that board separately? And, uh, you know, since they are considered you know, physicians and surgeons, but they do report to another board. How is that um, going to work out in reality? Then going on to uh, uh, people uh, taking four times to pass, well, that, that would be something to look at, given it could be an ADA accommodation that's required or something like that, or a sign of something more serious. Um, then down in the CME section, practice management content designed to provide better service to patients, including but not limited to use of technology or clinical office flow. Um, that may be a business manner, but I don't think they should be getting CMEs for that. Um, 
oftentimes what these CMEs are designed around is revenue generation, not medical practice. So I think that would send up a red flag because it's very easy to get a lot of free CMEs from, you know, different organizations that have nothing to do with actual practice of medicine. Records being accurate, absolutely, I agree a thousand percent with that. But the current environment we have with electronic medical records has done the opposite of what it was designed to do. And a part of that is linked to being paid to review records that you are oftentimes just making up or copying and pasting. So it takes you away from the intent of protecting the consumer, the patient, the victim, the injured worker, or whatever, and their relationship with their physician to be able to practice medicine. It's a business issue, and that should be uh, seen as a business issue because it interferes in the practice of medicine, one patient at a time. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any additional requests in queue. Thank you, Sean. We'll bring it uh, back to the board. Are there any additional comments or questions before we move to a vote on the motion? All right, hearing none, if uh, Ms. Caldwell, you could please call the roll. Mr. Bricks. Aye. Ms. Campaverdi. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Helzer. Yes. Dr. Krauss. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Luviano. Yes. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Mr. Rue. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Aye. Dr. Yip. Aye. Thank you. All right. The motion carries on AB 359. Uh, all right, Aaron, are we moving on to AB 1156? Yes, with pleasure. This uh, bill would enact changes relating to the postgraduate training license, a topic the board discussed at some length last night during the SB 806 agenda item. This bill is sponsored by several groups representing physicians and primary care clinics and seeks to address the concerns related to the PTL through a change in licensing standards. As indicated on page two of the analysis and stated on multiple occasions at board meetings, proponents of the bill report various problems being encountered by PTL holders, which include uh, not being able to work outside their residency program, also referred to as moonlighting, not being able to obtain a drug enforcement administration X waiver, which is necessary for the prescription of certain controlled substances, inconsistencies with family and medical leave policies, and the inability to sign certain state forms. Proponents indicate that these issues appeared following the change in licensing standards made during the board's prior sunset review in 2017 and took effect in 2020. This bill would maintain the requirement to obtain a postgraduate training license, but reinstate the previous licensing requirements that uh, requires the board to grant a license after 12 or 24 months of postgraduate training, depending upon where the individual attended medical school. During the board's discussion last night on Senate Bill 806, the board reaffirmed its position that 36 months is the appropriate amount of time that an individual should be in postgraduate training before obtaining their physician and surgeon license. And I would just, uh, just to note that the thrust of the bill is the licensing changes. There are some additional uh, uh, amendments in there that would address uh, in their own way uh, the ch some of the challenges pertaining to um, taking a leave of absence and some other issues. So I, I, I misspoke a moment ago. Um, but in light of in light of all of that context, Madam President and the board's position last night, uh, an opposed position on AB 1156 seems appropriate. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, Aaron, thank you. Uh, thank you for the context um, and also for for um, just providing a summary of the position the board took last evening on SB 806 and specifically the provisions as they related uh, to the postgraduate training license or PTL. I think that's important content. I, I know that there were some members um, of the board who weren't present last night uh, for that discussion, but that is how that discussion, uh, which, which was uh, comprehensive, turned out. 
I would like to check in uh, because AB 1156 is its own bill, of course. Um, I want to just check in because we have uh, more members present uh, today. Uh, find out whether any board members have comments on any of the specific uh, sort of areas of concern, I guess, that the bill is intended to address. Uh, or any perspective they'd like to share um, on AB 1156 uh, more more generally. Madam Chair, uh, just to repeat my comments, I do support 1156. I'm loner, I think, in this one, but as I mentioned before, that as a person involved with training for 40 years, especially primary care docs, and I, I think we are doing a disservice to the California consumers by not allowing these people or not giving them a chance to work in our state when they finish. And also for the residency programs, there are a lot of issues uh, from restraints to uh, signing some certificates, a lot of issues come into play. And in the end, uh, like I mentioned yesterday that on, uh, on 806, uh, they still need to finish uh, 36 months before they get a full license. This just gives them some more chance. I just want to reiterate my position of supporting this and also the other 806, those changes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganana Devon. I, I just want to clarify one statement you made, which is that, is that we're not giving opportunities for physicians to practice in the state. There's nothing in either SB 806 or SB 115 five, six, that, that, that would explicitly prohibit those physicians from practicing in our states. It's just that there are some administrative and other, you know, technical difficulties that relate to the licensing scheme um, uh, and the application scheme and, and the hospital privilege scheme that you've identified or you identified last night uh, that are causing you know, problems in that process, if you will. I just wanted to make sure that the record reflected uh, that neither of those bills prohibits physicians from practicing in California. Yeah, I, I agree with you. That's that wasn't the one if the circumstances make it difficult right. for them to stay in California. Right. Are there um, other comments or questions from board members on AB 1156? Any any thought about changing any of the position uh, the position we took last night on SB 806? All right, let's open it up for public comment. Okay, we've activated the hand raising function in the Q&A window for anyone wishing to make a public comment on AB 1156, please indicate so now. First up, we have Dennis Cuevas Romero. Dennis, are you there? Yes, I am, thank you. Uh, Dennis Cuevas Romero with the California Medical Association. Thanks so much for having this discussion on AB 1156. Um, you know, CMA and a coalition members have been having this discussion with the legislature for uh, just about two years now. Um, and, you know, one of the issues that we are concerned about is this concept that this is administrative hurdles or schemes that can be um, uh, solved outside of the legislature and statutory changes. We've tried those approaches and they have been unsuccessful for nearly two years. Um, and we've been told by various stakeholders that a statutory change is required to resolve the unintended consequences of um, the postgraduate training license and its implementation. So we think that AB 1156 or language similar to that um, will resolve those um, and make the necessary statutory changes. So we support um, the changes in AB 1156. And as we mentioned last night, we're hoping that language or similar language will get um, amended into SB 806 to resolve the issue. Thank you very much. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Tim Madden. Tim, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, Tim Madden, on behalf of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, and we are one of the co-sponsors of AB 1156. We appreciate the board's time spent discussing the PTL issues and your openness to address concerns being raised by numerous groups. We believe the provisions in AB 1156 would appropriately address the concerns around the PTL, including the moonlighting, um, obtaining an X waiver and leave issues, as Mr. Bone outlined. 
Without these changes, the issues with the current PTL will be further exacerbated as another class of residents will be subject to the same restrictions. Um, in addition to this, to kind of build off of Dr. Gananadev's comments, I'm hearing from multiple emergency medicine program directors that they are having residents really beginning to ask questions around the ability to moonlight and get an X waiver as well as the leave issues. And they're actually making decisions to not pursue residency programs in California as a result. So there, there is, we're seeing not only an impact on the existing residents, but ones who are considering coming into California. For these reasons, emergency physicians are in support of 1156 and ask the board to consider supporting the bill. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next, we have Vanessa Kajina. Vanessa, are you there? Hi, good morning. Thank you very much. Vanessa Kajina on behalf of the California Academy of Family Physicians, one of the co-sponsors of AB 1156. We appreciate the ability to be able to comment this morning. CEFP began to see problems for new PTL holders over a year ago, which due to the cohort-based timeline of obtaining a license, we believe will mushroom with more and more PTL holders unable to moonlight in FQHCs, obtain X waivers, and now get their full license on time if they've taken family or medical leave. We co-sponsored AB 1156 as our preferred approach to eliminating these problems while continuing conversations on the PTL through SB 806 and maintaining the entire concept of the PTL to begin with. The analyses portray this as a rollback. We urge the board to support the language in 1156 and that residents are eligible for a physician and surgeon's license after successfully completing those 12 months of postgraduate training in the US or 24 months in foreign medical schools. Allowing residents to be eligible for a physician and surgeon's license does not mean that residents will be moonlighting without the knowledge of the program director or without any oversight. Residents must obtain the approval of their program director before they are able to moonlight. Additionally, residents receive oversight from the supervising physicians when they are moonlighting. There's been no data presented to us on the frequency of residents leaving their programs after 12 months. We've requested this data and have not seen it. We welcome continuing discussions with the board staff who has had an open door policy from the beginning on our concerns and we very much appreciate it. To address the board's consumer protection concerns, we suggest additional language upon license renewal. The postgraduate trainees shall provide documentation to the board that they have completed that postgraduate training or shall provide attestation from the program director that they're in good standing making progress towards completing their training. As such, AB 1156, like I said, is our preferred approach. Our goal continues to be removing the artificial barriers created by the PTL while maintaining the oversight that is appropriate to ensure competency. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Juan Reyes. Juan, are you there? Yes, good morning, and thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Juan Reyes, and I serve as the Legislative Director for Assemblymember Akila Weber. On behalf of Assemblymember Weber, as the author of AB 1156, we're calling today to respectfully request your support of the bill and for your consideration of the issues that have been identified by the current licensing requirements relating to the PTL. A number of problems that did not exist prior to 2018 have arisen with the new licensing timelines and the requirement for residents to obtain a PTL. The PTL has been interpreted by several government entities as a restricted physician and surgeon license, having a negative impact on access to care and creating barriers for young professionals trying to begin their medical careers while also starting families. Some of the problems you've heard today include um, residents being unable to enroll as a Medi-Cal or Medicare provider or be credentialed by private commercial health plans or health insurance companies, residents being unable to obtain a Drug Enforcement Administration X waiver, limiting their ability to prescribe medication-assisted treatment for substance use disorder, thereby further limiting access to necessary care, and inconsistencies with family and medical leave policies. We believe AB 1156 adopts a hybrid model of the old and current licensing structures. Um, Assemblymember Weber is very passionate about resolving this issue, not only as a member of the Assembly Business and Professions Committee, but because she is a practicing physician who teaches resident physicians and therefore understands intimately the negative impacts that the PTL as it stands today is currently having. To be clear, our office strongly supports the completion of postgraduate training programs. We do not want residents leaving postgraduate training programs early and expect the requirements within existing law to safeguard against that such as the requirement that program directors notify medical board, the medical board of such instances. Our office looks forward to continuing to work with stakeholders, including the medical board, to ensure that consumers are protected and that California has a competent workforce of medical professionals. We'd respectfully request your support of AB 1156. And thank you for, your, for the time today. 
thank, thank you to the commenter for joining us um, on behalf of uh, the author of AB 1156. I just wanted to ask a, a question or two um, about the scope of the problem um, that we're that we're trying to solve for here. What do you have a sense of the number of people that are trying to bill Medi-Cal, for example, uh, that have the PTL and that, that are not able to? We would be happy to provide some of the instances that we've received from some of our stakeholders that have come to the legislature. Um, but in terms of the exact number before, I don't have that with me at, at this moment, but we would be happy to provide you of those instances when they've been unable to engage in that moonlighting um, activity. Okay. And then, um, I mean, just in terms of the um, I, I guess length of time of training, what I think I heard you say, uh, and I just want to confirm that, was that the author supports uh, the 36 month postgraduate training requirement. Um, and I guess I should say a completion of a program uh, that is 36 months in length and the board's interpretation of that 36 months uh, is that that could be inclusive, of course, if you've taken family or other uh, approved leaves. Uh, but I want to just make sure I understand that whether or not the, the author of the bill is um, believes that 36 month postgraduate training requirement is the appropriate length of time. What I can say today is that assembly member Weber is very supportive of physicians completing um, and receiving credit for having completed their training program. What we are curious to know is um, what sort of the impetus for the change and admittedly having not been a member of the legislature at the time of the change what information the board or other stakeholders may have of the uh, residents leaving their programs early and using the 12 month program that was or the 12 month threshold under previous law to obtain the full physician insurgent uh, license. And so, um, again, what I can say today is that assembly member Weber does not want to see residents leaving their programs early, but we seek to also understand kind of the issue that um, was. As we understand it, the impetus for the change in the first place. All right, thank you. All right, Sean, let's move on to the next public commenter. Next up, we have Natalie Diaz. Natalie, are you there? Hi, good morning. This is Natalie Diaz with the California Primary Care Association. Um, I just want to reiterate some of the points that I mentioned last night, um, but in terms of Cal the California Primary Care Association being in strong support of AB 1156 by Assembly Member Weber, which aims to remedy the various implementation issues that have come up due to the PTL requirements that went into effect on January of 2020. Numerous government agencies and payers, including DHCS, recognize the PTL as a restricted license, causing a myriad of obstacles for residents to deliver care during the COVID-19 pandemic and fill the provider shortage. The unintended consequences created through the PTL and mentioned today are having significant impacts to the delivery of health care in underserved communities, including those served by our community health centers. We very much appreciate the efforts that have gone into addressing this issue from the medical board and the legislature to date, but the current language in SB 806 does not address the fact that the current limitations of the PTL as a restricted license and new licensing timelines, which residents did not experience prior to 2020. We urge your support of AB 1156 today. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, I don't see any additional requests in queue. Thank you, Sean. We'll bring it back to the board. Are there any um, additional comments from board members? Or questions? Our current. Oh, we don't have a current position on AB 1156. We have a current position on PTL via our position on AB 806. Aaron, do you just want to uh, reiterate what that is? Um, uh, well, the board decided to adopt as a part of its support if amended position on SB 806 to maintain the 36 month requirement um, for licensure and that the the current licensing structure was appropriate um in the board's view and that there were the board was oh, was fine with some of the other kind of ancillary changes you know med, trying to address medical leave and family policies um signing state certain state forms 
sorry, that's a very messy position. I realize I articulated, but I haven't had a chance to clean it up since last night. But that was the that was the um, uh, the I think the sentiment behind the the board's position. Uh, fair enough. Thank, thanks, Aaron. And uh, I mean, given that that AB eleven fifty six is essentially taking this PTL issue uh, on its own outside of the context of the sunset review legislation. Um, I guess that that given where we ended up last night on the PTL issues as they were encompassed in SB 806 in that context, um, that would would lead me to believe that our position on AB 1156 would be an opposed position unless amended. I, I yeah I agree because the bill is would grant licenses prior to 36 months. Right. So. Uh, it, I, I'm happy to accept a motion uh, to oppose unless amended. Uh, or any other thoughts from board members? Would it be opposed or opposed unless amended? Excuse me, opposed unless amended. And, and the amendment to, to amend it in what way? Uh, well, I guess that's a good question. But when we try to amend it to be consistent uh, with the current standards? Um, yeah, I mean, I get the we could, but that would and the 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 direct goal of the bill is to change the current standards so asking them to amend the bill to be at 180 180 degrees from their goal is more likely leads to an oppo just an outright opposed position yeah i mean that that okay. that's you know that's my i i misspoke it would be an opposed position right because our position is to keep the current regulatory scheme uh in place yeah. In my opinion, that seems most consistent with the board's sentiment from last right. night, Madam President. This is Jim Helzer. Um, one of the concerns I heard was that uh, residents cannot currently enroll in the Medicare and uh, Medi-Cal programs as providers. Can the PTL be modified to allow for that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Helzer. Fantastic question. That's been the subject of much discussion. Um, at this point, it's unclear um, how or even whether that um, the P how the PTL can be amended in order to authorize um, individuals to enroll in the Medi-Cal program. We've had numerous conversations with DHCS to that effect. No pathway seems evident, um, and I, I think the the proponents that of, of the bill that you just heard from, I think they would affirm um, that as well. That there is no there is no apparent pathway to that. So, uh, therefore, then that speaks to um, the intent of the bill, which is to change the time frame for when uh, a physician surgeon license is granted. Because we, they, you know, we know right from history that there was no issue for physicians and surgeons, and that since the problems materialized once the PTL came into effect, therefore the the goal is move move that time frame back. So that way they're being granted a full license at the previously uh, indicated time and statute. And Aaron, I, you know, I asked the question um, of the author's representative as to how many people were affected by this. Yeah, uh, I mean, have you been provided any information as to really the number of, of people that are trying to bill Medi-Cal? You know that that hold a PTL and have been unable to. And then, is there any information? And, and I mean, you know, so we've talked about this, you know, on and off uh, as a board throughout the year, and, and looking for workarounds. But is there any information about whether the 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 programs themselves have sought any type of workaround for this? So I, I guess I'm I'm trying to understand really what the scope of this problem is, and whether the right solution is this legislative solution or if we should get creative and come up with you know guidance to these programs or for example the with respect to the 36 month requirement the board uh has interpreted that you know to mean it's inclusive of leaves etc so uh, anyway yeah. sorry my question is what what is the number of people we've been told how many people are actually having this problem and whether it's providing a real access to care issue yeah so um i don't have a report or any numbers uh, i've i've uh, i've asked for you know that, that kind of information as well um those reports you know statistical compilations don't seem to be available 
um, understand there's you know numerous instances that have been reported to me, and I've seen an example of, uh, you know, some examples of denial letters and email traffic to you know to that effect. But no, 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 no comprehensive way I think for us to you know get our arms around this. I I, I will note as well though that. I have seen letters from uh, that have been signed by a number of program directors um, uh, of training programs, you know, kind of up and down the state. So um, it, it it is something that um, there does seem to be a a broad uh, consensus, at least in amongst the folks that I've heard from, right, in the uh, in the postgraduate training program community, that it is a problem. I don't have numbers or anything comprehensive though beyond what i've just shared um, that i can provide and just, howard, just one right. other question howard just one other question before i get to you do we have assurances that that the way that this is drafted now w fixes all of those problems that have been identified so the agencies i mean this is a multi-agency you know issue do yeah. we have assurances from those agencies that if we change the language in this way if we made any of these um, well, if, if AB 1156 went into effect, that this would solve for the problems that um, have been identified to us. Um, so, I guess strictly speaking, no. I have no letter, or, or, you know, or, or you know, assurances that affect. I've I've not had a conversation with the Department of Healthcare Services specific to AB 1156, but based upon the you know the conversations um, to date. Um, uh, I, not being an attorney, it does seem like this is, you know, probably going to move in the right direction or, or address it because, again, if the problem materialized after we made the licensing change, which delayed the amount of time that an individual uh, uh, could, sorry, previously you could get a license within as little as 12 months. Now, as we've been discussing, it's it's 36. Um, I understand that it's very uncommon uh, or even unheard of for interns, those who are in their first 12 months to do any sort of moonlighting. But it's after the 24 month period is where they start to kind of get out into the field. So because under the previous licensing structure, they could do so and they had their full license and they were able to enroll in Medi-Cal, uh, I, I think it is fair to assume that the um, uh, this change would would probably you know fix it. But uh, I say that with all the caveats of not being an attorney and not having spoken with DHCS, uh, that's my best attempt, Madam President, at answering that. Thank you, Dr. Krause. Ms. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, I just want to point out again th with this current language, this is a rollback to prior licensing requirements. It, yes, it keeps a PTL, but after 12 months, a person would have a physician and surgeon license if they graduated from a U.S. medical school after 24 months if they graduated from an international medical school. Um, and remember, this doesn't do anything about the other piece that we changed when we went to 36 months of postgraduate training requirement, where we opened the door to many more medical schools without going through the evaluation process. So. This would be a rollback to to licensing requirements, and right. and yes, it would resolve the issue that people are raising because the person would have a physician and surgeon license after twelve months or twenty four months. Thank you. Right, and just to that. just for the benefit of the board members, can you just describe what our prior uh, you know, certification or evaluation process was for foreign medical schools uh, under the previous scheme? Because you're right, that isn't replaced here. There were two different pathways for foreign medical schools. One, if it was a a nonprofit. Uh, government approved school that was designed to train its own citizens for practice primarily in that country. Um, that had an easier pathway for recognition, but the other pathway was a for profit medical school that had the primary purpose of training individuals outside of that country for practice outside of that country that had a, a very rigorous, lengthy um, 
multi-layered process for approval that could even involve a site visit requiring uh, travel the long distance for board members and staff. Um, also a part of that is the board reviewed the clinical rotations that medical students did in their third and fourth years and made sure that a certain number of weeks was involved um, in the required categories. With 36 months of postgraduate training, the board felt that that was not necessary because they would be tested in postgraduate training. So that's a, uh, the board that let the school evaluation go so long as they were recognized by the World Directory of Medical Schools, for example. Right, so it's not just a rollback to our previous requirements. It does not include restoration of that rigorous process that some of these uh, schools previously went uh, went through. And and you know when I joined the board before um, uh, before our our prior sunset review process, uh, where the PTL you know license. Um, scheme essentially went into effect following that process. It was it was common for our staff to be traveling internationally, um, you know, for for a significant period of time to evaluate these schools. Um, and there was a significant amount of time on our board agendas uh, to have conversations about um, those four medical schools. So good. Th thank you for that. Those points, uh, Dr. Krause, I'll go to you. Yeah, I, I think we've been through what we view as appropriate training and education for those who have become licensees in California well enough to respect the, the value of 36 months and the value of completion of a residency program. And where our hearts have opened have been in trying to solve some of the problems that that presents to uh, those who are in training. I don't think the major issue is the Medi-Cal billing issue. And, and there's some irony in the Medi-Cal billing issue because if you look at a residency training program, uh, by its nature and design, residency training programs have supervision of licensed attendings. And when a resident is working in that setting, all of the services which are provided for Medi-Cal and Medicare recipients are billed under the name of the supervising attending physician. But then in the moonlighting circumstance, uh, the irony is that Residency programs have limited number of weekly hours during which residents are allowed to work. And with exception and approval of the uh, program director, they can have some hours set aside for moonlighting. But theoretically, it's part of their training program. But yet, on the other hand, the moonlighting is not supervised by a licensed physician. And therein comes the problem of billing Medi-Cal or Medicare. But I don't think that's the major issue that threatens our workforce. I think the major issue was touched on by Dr. Gananadev yesterday, and that is if someone does not have a license until the completion of that residency program, and it takes several months for them to have hospital privileges, then people are going to think twice about accepting a training program in a state where there's no ability to guarantee that they will immediately go to work in that same state as soon as they finish their program. So I would focus on on trying to figure out how to solve that problem to whether it be administrative or otherwise that will allow residents the security of knowing that they can seek gainful employment upon the immediate completion of their 36 month program, rather than to have a drastic rollback of our requirements uh, simply to solve a uh, Medi-Cal billing issue from moonlighting. Yeah, fair enough. Thank, thank you, Dr. Cross for those comments. and. Um, I, I just, did, yeah, just, a moment, just a moment. What, one thing I thought was interesting is it, we're not hearing about this application and hospital privilege issue, uh, you know, from from the public commenters or in the letters that we've received. So I hear that loud and clear from you and Dr. Gananadev. And as I mentioned last night, um, that that seems to be an issue that might be best solved by some coordination between um, uh, the board and the, the processes by which the, you know, hospitals um, go through that process rather than legislating. I am a, a, a strong believer that legislation is not the answer to every, uh, you know, problem that, that occurs. Um, and that seems to me one where legislation might not be 
the best vehicle to solve for that uh, particular problem. But Dr. Mahmood, we'll go to you. Yes, so I just wanted to one more time touch basis on this thing, people, primary care physician leaving California. Really, we have just heard arbitrary numbers. I did a lot of research last night. I can't really find the numbers, any significant numbers that people are leaving California because they cannot get license. If the number is 10, 20, 30, 40, it's not a big deal state of 40 million people, and you just change the whole thing for those 40, 50 people. And there has never been a problem in the last so many years that, okay, people are just leaving because they cannot get the license. Yes, people have issue getting license in California because California is a stingy state. California has higher level, the higher level of standards and they want more uh, scrutiny. Uh, but I really, I'm kind of skeptical that there are people leaving because uh, significant number of people leaving because they can get the license. So that is, I think, not an issue for us to address until somebody has a solid data numbers. Okay, in 2020, 1,000 physicians left state of California because they couldn't get the license. People leave because they can get better opportunity. If somebody will go to Arizona get the same amount of money as or even more than California and has less than half the expenses live there. That is their choice. People leave to Midwest and they just want to make more money and spend less money and that is their choice. And people come over here and they want to work extra hours to live in California. That is what not we are discussing over here. But if somebody has real data, how many people are leaving, then that should be discussed. Otherwise, arbitrary numbers to discuss here and give everybody this thing is just not really a good ballpark. And honestly, I have a lot of respect for Dr. Granadev and Dr. Cross. They are the most learned and educated people and they really know these things more. And I learn from them every single time they speak out. But on this particular issue, I really have a strong and the reason I'm saying is that I deal with a lot of people who come and do the residency and all that kind of stuff in this country, the immigrants and all the stuff because I help people on different issues on J1 visa, H1 visa, and because we our significant workforce is who's coming from out of the country. Because just on our graduates, we cannot rely on providing the full health care. So that is my take on this thing. Dr. Thank Dr. you. Dr. Hawks, you speak. Thank you, Dr. Mahmood. Uh, based on everything that's been stated, take the last three speakers. Motion to oppose. Thank you. Do we have a second? Second. I'm sorry, second. who did this from? Dr. Mahmood? Second. Thank you. Um, uh, question for you. Is this a motion to propose or a motion to oppose if amended? I, I believe it's, it's a motion to oppose for the reasons we stated previously. Oh, okay. That's yeah. correct. No, straight straight oppose. Just make a clarification. Thanks. Yep. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I just want to uh, answer some of the questions which were brought out by our own board members. One is Dr. Hilser. CMS follows the federal law. That's why they won't allow any billing by the PPL person. And the DEA is the federal government, so they don't allow giving you a DEA number without full license. So those were the issues which encountered. And for Dr. Mahmood, Actually, this came into play only in 2021. So I look at this legislation, 806 actually, it's better than 1156, 806 modification is a clean up legislation to what we passed before. I don't look at it as going back to, uh, to previous things. So that's why I just want to make it clear that any legislation when legislature makes, lot of constituents uh, go there, go to them to clean it up. And that's what my feeling is. All right, if there are no uh, further comments or discussion, we do have a motion in the second on the table. So let's, uh, any other comments before we move to a roll call vote? All right, Valerie. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Campaverdi. Aye. Dr. Ganadev? No. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Helzer? Yes. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Mr. Rue? Yes. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Dr. Yip? Yes. Thank you. 
All right, that concludes AB 1156. I think we are moving on, Aaron, to AB 1278. Yes, Madam President. Uh, AB 1278 requires all physicians to provide a written notification informing patients of the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, the Open Payments Online Database. And it also has a requirement to post a notice in an area likely to be seen uh, by patients informing them again of that database. Uh, the bill has been significantly amended since the board took a support position um, uh, at their prior meeting. And although the bill does not have the same level of robust disclosure to patients, staff still recommend the board maintain its support position on the bill as it would nevertheless improve awareness of the open payments database. I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Bone? Uh, Aaron, can you remind us of what level reporting was required uh, as a dollar amount? I can't remember exactly. Um, I'm pulling up. So the bill previously it stated, so I think when the board looked at the bill before doctor, it did not set a dollar threshold and it would have required, uh, triggered a reporting requirement for any amount. Uh, that a physician may have received is a payment or a uh, transfer of value, I believe. So it could be a lunch rather than a, you know, a check. Um, that's, so there was never a threshold, um, doctor. And that's still true? Uh, yeah, it's still true. And so the bill, the bill now, yeah, so before it, it said, if you had received, let me back up. So previously the bill said, if you received any payment or any transfer of value, then you had to make this disclosure. Now the bill says you shall make a, you shall uh, increase awareness of the database um, um, and do that in writing and post a notice on the wall in your office. And then you have to do it annually um, uh, to that physician, to that patient. Still reported to CMS, though. Excuse me. It's still reported to the data bank, the CMS. Is it still reported there, or just posted? I I think the database it gets information from the drug and device manufacturers. So I don't believe it creates. There's no reporting requirement, to my knowledge, for the physicians. Their their burden under the bill would be to simply create awareness of this database <clears throat> again through an initial and an annual uh, notification uh, along with um, posting something on the wall for people to see what they're waiting in the lobby. This is Alejandra. Um, may I, Madam Chair? I just want to make sure I'm getting this straight because this is one that I, I felt very strongly about last time. Um, now that we've removed the requirement of disclosing payments by any drug or device manufacturers, the only thing this bill is now saying is they must post a flyer or something like that, a notice, just letting people know that a database exists? Uh, there'd be two things. So they would have to provide a notice to each patient at the initial office visit. So think of the stack of paperwork that you get when you're visiting the office. Um, and then annually, you would have to be provided this notice and there would be an, a place for you to sign that, uh, I guess, you know, acknowledging that you are aware of the database. So that's the first portion of the bill. The other portion has to do with posting the flyer. I don't know how, I don't know how big it would be, but there's certain required information that would need to be posted uh, in a location uh, that I believe is likely to be seen. Um, yeah, uh, post this notice where the physician, the notices aren't anything that are specific to the doctor or their associations. The notice is simply an awareness of the database existing. You got it. Also, um, I just want to clarify that that was not a change that the board requested. Oh, yeah. Ms. Thank you. Ms. Verity, the, the we supported the... that change to the legislation. <laughs> yeah, no. Or Thank you, Ms. Webb. We've we've supported the bill um, as the board directed us to do, and and so now I appreciate the clarification, Ms. Webb. No, we've we've been vigorous in our in our support for this the, the whole way. Ms. Howard, 
entire meat has been taken out of this bill and the purpose of the bill. Um, it's it's hard for me to understand how uh, a flyer now and a stack of flyers and not being in any way customizable um, specific to the doctors uh, is going to move this patient protection intention forward personally. Well, I, I think that's a good, that's probably a good question for the author and the sponsor. We may hear from from them on the phone. Um, you know, I suppose they have the choice to stop the bill, right? Right? They can they can kill their own bill if they feel like you know it's not moving the needle at all. Um, but that would be you know that'd be up to them. But but unfortunately, this is the bill that's before the board for consideration today. Ms. Howard, I would move to support. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Who's got second from? Dr. Dr. Mahmoud. Mahmoud. Second. Thank you. Um, all right. Is there additional comment before we go to public comment? Laurie here. I just had a quick question. Please. For Aaron. Uh, I thought the the ten dollar threshold was still there. Is that is it not? No. Okay. No, the, I'm, I'm so the $10 threshold is, well, do you mean a thresh, like a triggering threshold for some reporting requirement from the physician? Is yes. that what you're asking? No. So in the fly, in the language of the flyer, if you look at, um, it's 60, it's 663 in the bill that's proposed to be added in the language of the notice that would go in the lobby or wherever there is reference to a $10 payment. So, um, and that's in, the, that's in a description of the web portal where it says the Sunshine Act, the Federal pay Physician Payment Sunshine Act requires the detailed information about payments and other payments of value worth over $10. So, I, so my understanding that is it's, that's the triggering, that's the trigger point for the drug and device manufacturers to make a report to CMS, who would then populate that information into the database. Is that helpful, Ms. Lubiano? Yes, thank you. Erin, this is TJ. You see, uh, this is the impetus of this new amendment has basically made this bill pointless for us to support because what we really wanted was those disclosures. That's what our whole yeah. discussion went on for a half an hour. So I would, uh, I wouldn't want this a, a support position on this bill. I know there's a motion on the floor, but it it, it yeah. doesn't really make sense. It's just paperwork. It doesn't really bring that much awareness. It 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 really doesn't serve the original intent that we supported. And I'm just concerned that we're just going support because support is what we said the last time. This bill has fundamentally changed. And I thought the position would probably be more appropriate. So, Mr. Watkins, let me let me just clarify that with you, because we're just taking this bill on its own at this particular point in time, right? The current status quo is that there's no information provided to patients about this database, right? We, they can find it on their own, but there's no information provided by physicians. I, I completely agree with you that this bill has been gutted from its previous version, which would have provided a higher level of disclosure. But is your position that we either not take a position or we oppose the idea that this this additional disclosure would be provided? Um, because to, to me, it feels like, yes, it's a baby step, but it's still a step in the right direction. Um, but if we want to take no position or, or oppose it, I mean, that's the prerogative of the board. Let's wait till the uh, till the authors come on to this ball because I'm curious as to why they made such uh, significant changes to this bill. All right, well, let's open it up for public yeah. comment. Then. And and I don't know that they're going to be here, Madam President. So uh, not sure, but hopefully they'll be there. Thank you. Let's open it up for public comment and hear more. Okay, so we've got him activated the hand raising and the Q and A window for anyone wishing to make a comment. Indicate so right now. Uh, first up, we have Christine Hildebrand. Christine, are you there? 
Hi, I'm Christina Hildebrand from Voice for Choice Advocacy. Uh, we educate and advocate for informed choice and transparency of what goes into your body. Uh, we're not taking a position on this bill, but I just wanted to give you, I don't know if the person who is the author of the bill, um, but we have been following it. So just some background on the bill. The reason the bill looks like this is because it was completely gutted by the California Medical Association by the CMA. And, you know, I, I hear uh, Ms. Lawson's comment that isn't this sort of, uh, I'm summarizing, but isn't this better than something? I agree it's better than something. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, I think the medical board should take a consideration of taking a stand on um, this bill isn't good enough. Um, I, you know, I think it, it was a really strong bill and it's what many of the people, many of the advocates that that speak every single time on these medical board meetings have been asking for. Um, and so, you know, if the medical board does not, uh, you know, does not sort of push in that direction, which I think at this point, you know, the bill has been gutted, it's not going to have that stuff put back in it. But I would hope that the medical board uh, in your conversations with legislators bring up that you are, that you would have liked to see that bill in its totality and that you'd like to see it brought forward again next year. Um, you know, I think the medical board, it, you you are the people that are that are there for the consumers, and this is a consumer issue uh, with physicians. So I really I really think this is your wheelhouse, and and I hope you do advocate for it in the future. Um, I think somebody's comment earlier is you know th that uh, if if constituents don't like it, they can go clean it up later. It is incredibly hard to get a bill as a constituent brought forward and actually have it go anywhere. Even as an advocacy group, it is incredibly hard for us to bring bills forward. There's just too many bills um, and lawmakers have their priorities. Th these are not their priorities. So, um, you know, I look to the, the wonderful advocate that brought this forward because of what she had gone through, uh, similar to what we hear on this board. But I really hope the medical board goes back and, and looks at whether they could help push a similar bill forward uh, next year. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Marion Hollingsworth. Marion, are you there? Uh, yes, um, I am. Uh, can you also see if you can connect with Wendy Connect since this is her bill and she is trying to get in? So um, if you could do that, that would be great. She's already in queue to speak. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, as for my um, position, AB 1278 is another example of a great bill that was watered down to virtually nothing by the CMA and Dr. Wining. This is about informed consent for patient. This flimsy bill now has no information that will alert patients to a doctor whose practice could be compromised by money from pharmaceutical or device companies. It's a sad commentary on CMA influence interfering with patient safety. It's another good enough being the attitude when it comes to healthcare. I hope it will come. I hope 1270 it will go through in some form so that patients will have some way of knowing if they are a doctor has a conflict of interest. Thank you. One moment. Sorry about that. Next up, we have Autumn Ogden. Autumn, are you there? Adam Ogden, are you there? I'll try back. Uh, next, we have Wendy Connect. Wendy, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you. So, um, as many of you know, I am the person who is responsible for the genesis of AB 1278. And I have to agree with Ms. Camperverdi and Ms. Lawson, what's happened to this bill is really devastating. But, um, to answer TJ, it's better than nothing. And what is true is that the only reason this bill was gutted like it is, was the CMA. And they have done everything that they can in their power to kill the bill, including not being truthful to their um, members. So, and I have evidence of this and it's just, I, you know, I, I've spent about um, the last couple months talking to doctors and at least 40 doctors at Huntington Hospital that have that have sided with this bill in its full form and have no problem with disclosure because these are honest doctors. So what the CMA has done, they've really cast like a shroud of secrecy and darkness and leading to the public to or wanting the public to believe or everyone to believe that all these affiliations are sinister. 
this is just not true. A, a doctor um, involved in research or, or innovation, this is a good thing and patients don't think it's a bad thing. But the truth is patients need to know all the information so they can make an informed decision. And honest doctors are not afraid of transparency. In my case, you know, it would have changed my life. <laughs> I wouldn't be living with looking at a seventh surgery. I wouldn't be looking at having pain and deformity for the rest of my life. So I just, and I know I am not the only harm patient in California. You know, as all the research indicates, the more uh, doctors are paid to do stuff, the more the harm goes up. That's pretty much a documented fact, but, you know, people need to know this information and what the CMA has done has really been like almost ter terroristic uh, tactics to, to get legislators to force us to amend the bill. Now, the bill is um, basically just in its bare bones form. Uh, we're trying to let people know about a site that exists <laughs> and that they should know about and the onus should not be on the patient to have to do this research, I fully agree, and I was hoping that would not happen, but perhaps passing this, and I so appreciate the medical board supporting this bill, but at least passing it in this form will allow us to, you know, maybe dig deeper and maybe create a change, but it's something that the public deserves to know about. And I urge the medical board to voice their opinion to keep a B1278 alive because it's very threatened in appropriations where it's going next Monday. And um, if I would please, please urge you to um, support it and let your support be known to Senator Portentino. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Virginia Farr. Virginia, are you there? Hi, it's very frustrating to see yet another bill being watered down by the CMA. And when it comes to patient safety, the CMA is always fighting against patient safety and overriding the medical board and bullying the legislators and you guys provide the license to the CMA. Maybe you guys need to communicate some guidelines to the CMA that enough is enough and you're tired of patients being harmed because of their bullying terrorist like tactics. This is where all the harm is coming is CMA doing stuff. And you guys keep providing them license and letting it happen. And this again is going to affect people. People will die. People will be harmed. And it's because of CNA bullying. And it's just really frustrating that people will die because of this and they're allowed to do it. And nobody's monitoring and regulating this group of doctors that you provide license to. So um, I really feel sorry for the people that are going to be harmed again. Thank you. Thank I'd just you. like to uh, clarify uh, that the Medical Board of California does not provide a license or otherwise license the California Medical Association. They're a completely separate uh, and independent, you know, organization. And I think, you know, again, if you have some concerns uh, with them, they should be directed, you know, appropriately uh, to the California Medical Association, but, but the Medical Board of California does not license that organization. Next up, we have Rosie Arthur's daughter. Rosie, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, okay, just regarding these disclosure posters or whatever you want to call them, it doesn't matter what venue you're in, whether it's in a medical venue or business venue, these are not very effective um, to, to give notice to the consumer or the people that need to know. Uh, typically what you will find is people ignore them when they see them because they have no reason to even know what it's about. I mean, you read them, they're so vaguely worded uh, and you're usually in a high stress sort of a situation, you know, and, and you may not pay attention to it. You know, you, you need to get your health care or whatever. So it posting it in an office even is not going to really necessarily help signing a document. You sign lots of documents, like was pointed out, you know, just another one of them. I worked in a building that had over 50 break, break rooms 
and only one of them had the poster hidden in a corner that most of the 10,000 people that work there never even went into that room that talked about filing for disability. So, and that was all that they had to have was that one poster up for 10,000 people and 50 break rooms. So, how this is rolled out and implemented, you know, will greatly dilute whatever effect it was going to have on it. So, you know, it really needs more meat to it. You know, maybe you need to push back on it to, you know, have something in there that um, makes it easier for the consumer to be able to uh, access the information that's there. Anyway, that's just, just my comment. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. I wanted to try to go back to Autumn Ogden. Autumn, are you there? Okay. Uh, next, we'll go to Emily Hugh. I'm sorry, Emily Hughes. Emily, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, this is Emily Hughes with the California Medical Association. Um, I do want to clarify a couple things. Um, I'll start first just to clarify that that visual posting in the lobby is actually um, amended to be on the med boards posting as well. So where you guys are posted in the lobby is where uh, this disclosure will be as well. It will be one document. Um, I am sincerely apologetic for the situation of the constituent of Assemblymember Nazarian, but I am also extremely personally um, offended that she has said that I have lied to our members and I, I would I would genuinely be open to speaking with her and asking how that happened. Um, we strongly, strongly support patient safety and transparency. And from the beginning of the introduction of this legislation, we have offered amendments to the author to get his bill through that would both give information to patients as well as remove that administrative burden from physicians that we know are struggling right now. They cannot afford to hire software engineers to update record keeping or administrative assistants to help with the record keeping of this. We also did not want that patient visit to turn from, like it was said, a very emotional, personal, health-focused visit to a visit about a physician's financials. The perception of impropriety is, and I, I apologize, but that is what happens when when people patients are given oh this is the money that i was given and uh assemblyman nazarian's constituent actually i'm a little bit confused because she first said that being paid was a positive thing that physicians receiving this money was positive because they're doing research which i absolutely agree with it is positive these are people who are getting education and sharing that education with their peers and then followed up by saying that the more they are paid the more risk there is to the patient so i'm a little confused about that but i just again wanted to clarify um, the visual posting that i have never ever lied to our members that cma supports patient safety and that i would like to say just standing up for our members um, the rheumatologist, the cardiologists, and all the other specialty physicians who genuinely care for their patients. That these are these are good physicians who have proposed this. That is all. Thank you so much. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Eric Anders. Eric, can you are you hear there? Me? Yeah. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Oh my gosh, Emily Hughes is a paid spokesman for the California Medical Association, which is a union to protect its doctor members. And less than one third of California's doctors 
even belong to this organization. Of the third that belong to them, they are forced to join by local medical societies. They do not even join of their own free will. I spoke to a doctor not that long ago who didn't think he was a member of the CMA, but when I looked him up, he was there. He had no idea. And he found out that it was only because he joined his local medical society. This union is like a mob. All they want to do is thwart patient safety issues. We have documentation over the years. Mr. Andrus, do you have a comment on this legislation? Yeah, this is exactly relating to that. You need to stop shutting people down because you're trying to, to get away from the CMA issue. Christina, you have now tried to take away what people are talking Mr. about. Mr. Andrus, do you have a comment on AB 1278? I already answered that. I just said yes, I am commenting. And make the comment. Please. I'm making it, but you keep interrupting. You keep trying to, to diverge away from the fact that the CMA is, is influencing the medical board. You, you shut down Marion's comment earlier because she directly wanted an answer to TJ's question about the CMA. You've got to stop shutting down the public over the CMA. The CMA has a huge influence on the medical board. Huge. And you keep trying to shut it down after this huge Los Angeles Times expose that you proved have it, a comment Christina. on AB 1278. If not, Sean, please close. You are you are purposely trying not to see my comment. Purposely. You are trying to, to dissuade and get out of me letting talking about this because you don't want me proving that the CMA oh, has influence. Next commenter, please. At this time, there are no more additional questions here. All right, we're bringing it back to the board. Um, is there any further discussion by board members on AB 1278? I think we have a um, motion for support from, uh, it's gonna escape me, Dr. Krause, second yes. by Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Dr. Yes. I usually have, don't have a problem voting uh, one way or the other. This bill, I can tell you the way it is now, I can either support because it's something uh, rather than nothing. I can oppose because we didn't get anything what we everything we wanted, or we could say neutral. So it is a tough one, but just wanted to point out. Additional yes. comments? Yes, it's Alejandra. Um, after hearing from the advocates and Wendy herself, I am comfortable supporting this because I hear what she's saying. Sure. But I also do think it's important what was said also earlier about making um, our voice heard on this, um, Aaron, about the fact that what we did support initially was stripped out. Um, and I dispute the narrative of patients not having these disclosures um, being something that is not absolutely critical. Um, on a personal note, in a, in a week, I'm having a surgery to have a device put into my body and every patient who has that experience has the right to know what their doctor's relationships are with these companies. I personally am fine knowing that my doctor has a relationship with that company, but I had the right to know that. So I think it's very important that we don't just let our initial support position um, just kind of fade away and make this known that we would like to see this addressed in the future. And Madam President, um, we could certainly um, include the board's historical views, you know, on the prior version of the bill as well in an updated letter. Um, we can, you know, if the, if the board uh, approves the support position, we can include, you know, the board's the sentiment that I'm hearing from the board members, including Ms. Campaverdi, that can be incorporated into our updated position letter. Thank you. I think that would be appreciated. Additional. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just a quick comment. I'm, I, I can support this too because the author of the actual bill say, uh, indicated that the support would be appropriate. But I want to caution us because this is just becoming a theme that we are on a better than nothing acceptance level. So the standard is very low when we, when we ever go, always go at better than nothing and never take a position that says, no, this is not that this is not adequate. If we don't move the needle or move the standard when they trash a bill or something that we feel strongly about, or maybe we don't, I don't know, then we're just going to say it's okay for them to decide our fate. And I just get increasingly that sense 
that our fate is decided for us and we just have to kind of sign off on it. And I don't know if that is kind of what we supposed to do. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments on AB 1278 before we vote. All right, Valerie, please call the roll on the support position. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Campoverdi. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Yes. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Helzer. Yes. Dr. Krauss. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Mr. Rue. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Yes. Dr. Yip. Yes. Thank you. All right, that motion carries. So I think we are moving on uh, to SB 310. Yes. The last, the last bill um, I think that we need to consider. Regrettably, it's our last one today, Madam President. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Senate Bill 310 establishes until January 1st, 2027, a cancer medication recycling program administered by a surplus medication collection and distribution intermediary or SMCDI, to allow for the donation and redistribution of cancer drugs between patients of a participating physician. When the board last discussed this bill, SB 310 would have required the medical board to administer the program. The board was concerned about the cost and workload impact, and therefore it adopted an opposed and less amended position. Um, the, that concern, fortunately, was satisfied in a subsequent amendment as another entity regulated by the Ford, Board of Pharmacy is now proposed to run the program. Therefore, the board's position is now neutral. In a later amendment, the bill was updated to include language that limits the board's authority to discipline licensees who are involved in this medication recycling program. This inhibits the board's mission and staff have engaged in multiple conversations with stakeholders to reflect these concerns, which are similar to that of Senate Bill 57, which the board uh, discussed at a prior meeting. Uh, my analysis points out the concerns raised also by the Board of Pharmacy, which now has a significant role in this program as their licensee would be the administering body. I received late last night some proposed amendments from the sponsors that they indicate are intended to address the concerns uh, raised by board staff with regard to our disciplinary authority. Uh, unfortunately, I've been unable to analyze them and provide a revised analysis to you all today as I received them late last evening. In light of the various factors before us today, um, we recommend that the board adopt an opposed unless amended position as indicated on the last page of the analysis. After the board is amended, staff will be able to review those amendments. And if the amend amendments address the requests in our position, then the board's position would automatically change to neutral. Happy to answer any questions, Madam President. Hey, Ryan Brooks. Why would this be the medical board from a jurisdictional standpoint? Um, uh, well, the ability to enforce because it's, it's I, I apologize, Mr. Brooks. I don't mean to speak over you. The um, it's our licensees, it's the board's licensees will be the participating physicians <clears throat> that would be engaged in the practice of collecting the medication and then ensuring that it meets the qualifications of the program and then redistributing those medications to uh, a patient. So I was, you know, I was against this before. I mean, look, the concept I'm 100% in agreement with, but I just have an issue if, you know, we're going to vote to support something for our licensees, but we have no way of regulating that or controlling that. I mean, this is a board of pharmacy issue, not necessarily a medical board issue. I, am I missing something? Um, so there's going to be, so the, I'd say the core responsibility for oversight of the program would land more with the Board of Pharmacy because it's their licensee is the intermediary that, that would be administering the program. So you've got the Board of Pharmacy and then they're overseeing <clears throat> the eight, the entity that is administering the program <clears throat> where we are involved is in 
uh, uh, investigating any complaints and disciplining any of our licensees who are the physicians that are taking the medications from a patient and redistributing them to another patient. Is that helpful, Mr. Brooks? Yes, and then what are there regulations and controls around how that distribution should be made? Because if there's a complaint, and right now the bill, from what I understand, does not address, you know, kind of the guidelines on how should it be implemented. I mean, will this go through a rule making process? Um, I don't know. I don't anticipate a rule making process. So the bill does create it lays out in statute quite a few uh, requirements for the participating physician to abide by. Um, so those are those are laid out in one of the sections of the bill. Um, but again, there is this kind of, you know, uh, we that where we have this area of responsibility um, is going to pertain to any disciplining that we may want to do. And, and I and I will I, just to clarify, it's not. It's not an outright ban on us disciplining these physicians. There is some language in there that that clouds our authority that limits our authority. Um, and um, and staff believe that that's that that's unnecessary um, and that we should not be inhibited in any way uh, to discipline physicians who uh, violate the standard of violate the standard of care. Thank you. Um, you know, at this point in time, my position is going to be opposed until we clarify those issues because it's critically important if we're going to start a new program. And I think this program is a huge benefit to the consumer. Thank yeah, you. So, no, I appreciate that, Mr. Brooks. And so, as I mentioned before, I received some amendments last evening from the author and the sponsors. Uh, they may be addressing our concerns. I haven't had the chance to analyze them before our board meeting, you know, right now. So that's why, you know, we recommend the opposed unless amended position, which is outlined in the analysis. And if the amendments resolve the concerns once they go into print, well, then, you know, everything's fine. And then we would, um, we would become neutral. The other area, though, that is in the recommendation is to in essence, uh, be supportive of the requests of the Board of Pharmacy, and those are those are noted um, in the analysis as well. Ms. Howard, please. Uh, I would move uh, as Aaron has recommended to take an opposed and less amended uh, position, um, but I have some concern about uh, after amendments shifting into a neutral position, uh, because as was uh, suggested by the previous speaker. This may have, this may end up being of great benefit to consumers, uh, and we might want to consider ultimately uh, supporting it if uh, the language uh, is amended appropriately. But my motion is to oppose unless amended. Jim Helzer, second. Thank you, Dr. Krause and Dr. Helzer. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry, it's just Alejandra. Um, just saying that I agree with Dr. Krause to move our position to support if amended. Um, you know what I mean? The support <laughs> once it's. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Ganadev, I, uh, Aaron, so what are the, I mean, this looks like a, a decent program where these expensive drugs are not being thrown away and they're filling the, uh, uh, filling the sites where we throw all the stuff out rather than use them. So. What are the disciplinary issues actually we think it might create? I, I'm just trying to figure out it started as some kind of a public benefit pro bono program and now it came to, to about disciplining. So what uh, what are the issues? Can you explain to me? Yeah, so um, in the second section of the bill, it speaks to, uh, it is where it kind of lays out uh, the, the the liability issues and so previously the bill has had for some time a criminal and a civil liability protection for the licensees and and that was fine there was no issue with us because that didn't get in the way of the board's disciplinary authority but then it, it was late so after the board's last meeting that the the disciplinary authority was limited so what it says is that um if you are amongst others if you are one of the physicians um, you are not subject to disciplinary action for in for an injury caused when donating, accepting, or dispensing prescription drugs in compliance with this division. 
it goes on to say those immunities do not apply in cases of noncompliance with this division, gross negligence, recklessness, intentional conduct, or in cases of malpractice unrelated to the quality of the medication. So seemingly that might leave us with um, incompetence, which is not, and simple negligence. Those are elements that are not included in that list of exemptions to the liability protection that I um, that I mentioned. Um, there's later language in the bill that then says this division shall not affect disciplinary actions taken by licensing and regulatory agencies. So the language is very, it's very challenging for us to work through and figure out, you know, what it means. Um, you know, and it may require, you know, if we do get a um, if we do get a complaint and it goes to hearing and it becomes adversarial, then it could be it it, it could become a, something very sticky that we have to kind of unroll <laughs> and, and figure out through you know that adversarial process. So staff's position is that there should not be any hindrance to the board uh, when it comes to investigating its licensees who fail to meet the standard of care. Is that helpful, Doctor? Yeah. So I I'm. Because I mean, the program actually looks these are the expensive drugs, and uh, the consumers are the ones who benefit. So, why didn't you recommend support if amended? That means the amended amendment should be take uh, not to take away our uh, obligation of disciplinary uh, uh, proceedings. So, if the and the board's welcome to do that, but if the board took a supportive amended position and then the bill was never amended then we would not be in a position to be able to seek a veto or you know take further action um we could we could request a signature from the bill from the governor if he if the uh, if the bill were to be amended as requested but in that event where for whatever reason the language does not go in that we want then um we staff would be unable to advocate for a veto okay that, that, that's all I'm okay thanks Dr. Um, Mahmoud, can I make a quick comment? Please. Yeah. So I actually am really of same thought process, Dr. Gandhav, is that these are extremely expensive medications, and there are so many of our consumers who cannot have access, and these drugs are being wasted. Program is, in my opinion, in my daily practice, what I see, this is an, a huge, remarkable resource. And we still take a position to support if amended, at least we will do our obligation to help people to get this stuff because these people's life really relies on that. And with this, these drugs, somebody might live three months or six months and a year longer and take that little risk. But obviously we'll push on amendment, but take a support position if amended instead of just outrightly say that, and that will just completely take us away from that. So that is my a uh, strong point on that. Thank you. This is Alejandra. I was going to add, I, I know that Aaron, you haven't had a chance to review what you received last night. Perhaps when we go to public comment, we may hear from the authors about what was in that that could help guide our decision. And um, I expect right now. that. I expect okay. that. All right. Shall we go to public comment? We do have a, a motion already from Dr. Krause, seconded by Dr. Elder. All right, we're ready for public comment. Sean, please open up the line. Okay, the hand raising feature and Q&A window has been activated for anyone wishing to make a public comment. Indicate so at this time. Uh, first up, we have Rosie Arthur Sutter. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? I can. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I remember a few years back, a big controversy about cancer drugs and a compounding pharmacy. Now, the way this is written, uh, I don't see any mention of compounding pharmacies or medications that have been, you know, compounded individually. Uh, are those excluded from this? Or if they meet whatever criteria the Board of Pharmacy um, puts in place, that's okay. It's just a, a question I have. The other question I have is just as far as the, from the consumer looking at it and having to source medications that are prescribed where the doctor doesn't know that the medication has been recalled. 
et cetera, et cetera, and that happens all the time, that, um, you know, we need to be careful when we're looking at this process that considerations be made for drugs that are either explicitly recalled or voluntarily recalled or where the manufacturer has medications that are recalled because some men, uh, labs have had contamination of more than one product along the lines by an MDA, et cetera, et cetera. And we could be recycling something inadvertently with the best of intent that may not have its, it may have an un unintended consequence. The other thing is with the limitations on, you know, it has to be still six months remaining, but if you've got a month prescription of something and there's time to distribute it and use it within that month, you know, that would seem to be okay. I mean, if I throw away something that's still usable within the original intended time, again, these are expensive medications, difficult to get, etc. And, you know, the thought that somebody could be throwing something down the drain because it's one day past six months and there's only a month's worth that could be, you know, the difference between life and death or improved quality of life. So th those would be suggestions maybe for when you're asking for amendments, if you ask for amendments to um, consider, at least that's from the consumer's perspective and advocate's perspective. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Autumn Ogden. Autumn, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Okay, yes, thank you so much. Um, Autumn Ogden Smith, American Cancer Society, Cancer Action Network. I am one of the co-sponsors of the bill and we do apologize for the lateness of our amendments. As I'm sure you're aware, this is a very dynamic process. And we um, have been working, as Aaron um, said, uh, with the staff and I've heard your concerns about any limitations regarding the board's authority and the amendments last night do correct that. And those are in with the appropriations committee. Now they will be amended coming out of appropriations. So those are final amendments that address all of the concerns that the board had um, to also address what Aaron was saying. We have adopted the board of pharmacy recommendations um, and to just speak to this the previous commenter compounding drugs are excluded from this bill and also um, doctors per this the language in this bill must monitor and be aware of changes in medications recalls um, to participate in this program so i hope that this helps the board understand the bill better um, i think that when you take a closer look at the language you will see that um, we are, we're, we're requesting that you continue with the support if amended, um, as we believe the amendments do address all your concerns. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, up next, we have Nicey Short. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Nisette Short, representing the Association of Northern California Oncologists. We are the other co-sponsor with the American Cancer Society Cancer Answering Network. So again, thank you so much for your positive comments about the bill. We've been working on this for quite some time. Um, and just for the same reasons that you all, so many of you all uh, mentioned in your testimony, um, these drugs are very expensive. They're obviously uh, very needed for our patients that have been diagnosed with cancer. And our physicians were really struggling with what to do with unused, perfectly good cancer medications when they also had patients that were desperate for those same medications. So this bill um, helps patients and it helps oncologists help their patients. And we've done a lot of work to um, make the bill uh, include a lot of patient protections in the bill, because obviously that is our, our first goal um, of all legislation that we work on. So um, as again, as Autumn mentioned, um, the amendments that we have agreed to take um, do address the concerns that we've heard from the medical board and, and many of the amendments from the Board of Pharmacy. And uh, we would uh, appreciate the commentary around a supportive amended position and uh, would encourage that to be your amendment that or to be your position that you vote on this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Uh, this time there are no additional requests in queue. 
Thank you, Sean. All right, I'll bring it um, back to the board. And I, I just have a clarifying question, Aaron, about our position, given what we've heard um, you know, from, from the authors in terms of what those amendments that are in your email inbox include. If we yeah. take an opposed and less amended position because the current draft of it that we have before us um, I guess is consistent, you know, uh, I guess that would be more consistent with where we're at. Once those amendments are taken, can that just, can we just shift that or provide the direction to you that that shifts to the support position? Um, I mean, that would be then to, the the mechanism to do that would be to adopt a supportive amended position. It is supportive. Okay. But well, I, I, yeah. guess, I, I guess the, what I'm concerned about is what you articulated uh, previously, which was if the amendments don't actually get in there, then yeah. uh, can we advocate for a veto um, following that? And I know now we're, now we're getting into technical uh, yes. legislative yeah. advocate speak. Yeah, this is a, 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 a technical and creative discussion to uh, oppose a bill, considering opposing a bill unless it's amended in the way that we want. But then, if it does get amended in the way we want, then we want the bill to be signed. I, I've I would have to spend some time to kind of wrap my mind okay. around that. That's that's a very creative approach, I would say. So otherwise, we so, should support it if it's amended. I I, I that's the board. I mean, that's the question for the board. I mean, if the so board wants to take more of a you know a carrot approach, then. You know, if, if all these amendments that the board asks are approved, then you would be directing staff to support the bill and ask the, yeah. the governor to sign the bill. Conversely, you could take the negative approach, which is opposed right. unless amended. And I mean, I guess I, I guess I would say is if if the amendments that are in your email inbox aren't really what they say they are, which I don't have any reason to think they won't be based on what we've heard. Um, well, and I, I, it, I, I, you are, you've got a good understanding of this discussion too. So. Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, I, I don't know the, with regard to, I think the biggest question might be with regard to some of the requested amendments from the Board of Pharmacy. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, I included that for the board because, for the board's consideration, because they are going to be the lead consumer protection agency, if you will, right, in overseeing the program administrator. We have our own role that I, you know, discussed, you know, to Mr. Book's, you know, question. So, uh, you know, my my opinion was that, well, if Board of Pharmacy thinks that these are important things to help them in their consumer protection role, well, then that's a that's a good thing for this board's consideration as well. Great. Thank Ms. you. Howard. Please. So, Aaron, I, I, I think we're safer to maintain the opposed and less amended. And one of the frustrations that we run into historically is we meet quarterly. Uh, but the legislation changes daily. Uh, and in the past, we have often given guidelines to our uh, legislative advocate that if such and such changes is in the bill, uh, we give you the authority to do such and such. So I would rather uh, arrive at a circumstance where if our amendments uh, are accepted, uh, and there's not much other substantive change in the bill where we would authorize uh, Aaron to uh, then move us to a support position rather than to be trapped uh, in, uh, you know, the opposed and less uh, amended uh, indefinitely. But I would, I would prefer to stay at opposed and less amended. So uh, Dr. Krauss is 100% uh, accurate. And I think our challenge with this board and how we beat is a bit more of an issue of the calendar than anything else, because the time this board beats again, this bill would have already been done and passed through the legislature. And yeah. so my question, and I agree also with you know, Dr. Krauss on continuing our position, because I hear from the advocates that our amendments will be incorporated. So now my question was one for legal counsel. We take it a position today that uh, says oppose a less amendment, amendment and if amended, uh, we give authority to the president of the board to change our position without a formal vote of the board. I don't know if we could do that or not. But Dr. Cross, I think you're spot on. Yeah, I think that this board can give that kind of authority. Then my uh, question is if Dr. Cross would consider omitting his um, omitting his motion to include, if amended, 
uh, we provide or give the president of the board the authority to switch to support. So, so, so moved and so amended. Thank you. All right, does the seconder of that motion um, uh, agree? Yes, I agree. Okay, the, the, I, I, Madam Chair, I, I, Dr. Garrett, yeah, actually, with that, I can support. If not, I was going to vote no on the on the opposed and less amended alone because this is, as a person who works for an entire career at a county hospital, this is a huge benefit for the patients, and I don't want it, my name on something to oppose something helps people. So, okay. So if so, I can clarify, may I? Before we vote, Doctor, you are not going to be the only one because I, I also as fourth generation cancer in my family. I understand how critical and important these medications are. If it is able to assuage people's concerns, you know, when we look at the fact that the amendments that were asked for by the Board of Pharmacy, you know, they took an already took an opposed unless amended position, and they will be the oversight function. And so there are some stopgap measures here where they already are tying all of these amendments together and are already going to oppose unless amended. So does that give us some um, security that we could do a support if amended? So here, here's what I'm hearing our position is. I'm hearing our position on the draft that came in our board packets is opposed unless amended and that we're providing authority uh, to change that position once Aaron has a chance to to support, once Aaron has a chance to review those and confirm they're consistent with the board's direction and yes. discussion, essentially delegating the authority, I guess, to me uh, to work with Aaron on that to modify the position so that in the event these amendments don't actually, excuse me, do actually address the concerns we've all been discussing today, that our position doesn't go into print as opposed unless amended, it goes into print with the support position. Aaron, is that what you're hearing? That that that's what I'm hearing. Okay. So what what we're seeking is on page 4, there's four bullets that are reflective of the Board of Pharmacy's position. So we're seeking those those four items to be addressed and we are seeking to remove any language that limits the board's authority to discipline physicians participating in the program. Yeah. And that if and then practically just kind of thinking through the mechanics of this, if the bill is not amended to consistent with the board's position, then we would be seeking a veto. If the bill is amended consistent with the board's position, then we would be seeking a signature from the governor. Correct. Um, That's what I, would I, I would clarify something, Aaron. If it's not amended to exactly what we want, I'm not sure we would be seeking a veto of the bill. Right, and from what I heard from the advocates today is that our amendments are going to be taken and incorporated. And so I'm very comfortable today at with our position. I think everyone on this board wants this bill to work and go through. And I think the process that we went through of opposing earlier brought us to this point. So this bill is a much better uh, bill. And I think the board of pharmacy did the exact same thing. So this bill is a much better bill. And everyone came together, and I think we're going to get across the finish line. So, if that's the sentiment of the board, um, then then really support if amended, I think makes makes sense. If the if if the if the board's desire is this bill gets signed, then tasking us with an opposing less amended position, I don't I don't understand. But, uh, I, I let, let me let me help this discussion. Let me help. Because I think that I think we're getting caught up in these technical details about this position at this point. What I'm hearing is that we have a support position if this packet of amendments, which apparently is in your email inbox, is actually adopted. That we've got a support position for this legislation. And I'm hearing we're not ready to say that today because that's not in print, right? So I, I think that the appropriate thing to do is to delegate to me and to Dr. Hawkins the ability to work with staff to make sure our position adequately or, or, or accurately reflects uh, the position of the board that we've heard here today, which is that we're gonna support this if those amendments are taken. So once we have a chance you know, over the weekend and, and early next week to take a look at those and say, yes, these check all the boxes or no, they don't. 
And I believe that's what the motion Correct. is. Essentially delegate authority to the comments? board president and the board vice president. I would ask, I, I added Dr. Hawkins, I'd ask that you add both of us yeah. uh, to that. Can I ask one final clarifying that's, question? That, that's, comfort level here, because I, I just saying um, voting oppose on this kind of turns my stomach. Aaron, having that opposed position, albeit for a day or a few days or however long that is, is there any way that that hurts this bill in the meantime? Uh, is there any way? I guess, yeah, there's, I guess there is, there is some way. Uh, um, part of that will depend upon, you know, how quickly a letter can be turned around and published, how quickly the amendments can be, can go into print. So there's, there's definitely some of those, some of those factors. And if the uh, amendments look good and they go into the bill before uh, we get a letter out, then we wouldn't have to send out an oppose unless amended letter. Suck to my mood. Can and, I then, make and then therefore the, the hurt, so to speak, or the harm would be, uh, you know, I, I think negligible, if any. Is there some reason we would have to send out a letter? I mean, I'm hearing that maybe that, you know, we're not. No, we don't really have to do anything. I mean, we, that's how it works. You send a letter. I, typically. I, I, yeah. I really think, I mean, we're, we're kind of going around and around and around because this is confusing. Um, and so I'd yeah. like to help us reach a conclusion to this discussion. Can, can I make a quick comment before you go on the thing, please? Yes. Um, this, this is, this is a situation which is a remarkable resource for people who have nothing else. And we are becoming a hindrance by opposing it if amended. Why we cannot facilitate if amended? Why we are not there to help those? And our really goal and mission is to help those, not only people who have like malpractice and everything, even people who are hurting and who are suffering and whose life is going to be limited by not getting this medicine. And we are just playing on the game that, okay, we'll oppose if amended. Why not? facilitate this thing, give them our blessing if amended. And when sponsor is coming and giving us surety that they are willing to do the amendment and they're already sending the things, I don't know why we are so much stuck up on opposing that, okay, this is going to be what it is. So, Dr. So, Mamou, I, I, I let strong, me correct you. 100%, the, the board consensus agrees with you. The problem is that the bill that's in print right now doesn't reflect the board consensus. So I need to get it to the point where we have, where, where the bill that is in print in front of the legislature is married up with what I'm hearing from this board. And I suspect that's gonna take less than a week to do. So we're taking this interim position because that's what's in front of us. And Dr. Hawkins and I will work to make sure that this board's position is reflected if you delegate the authority to us to do that next week. There's an equally effective uh, motion that solves our goal if everyone's more comfortable with it. Uh, Aaron's concern was if we took a support if amended position and it wasn't amended that we wouldn't be able to solicit a veto. The other option would be to take a support if amended position, but also give the board president and vice president and Aaron the position that if it's not amended, then to switch us to oppose. Exactly. That, that that is that is the right way to do it. yes and so you know when i look at this from a this is not a philosophical issue we're all on the same page that this is a fantastic bill this would, uh, would help consumers this is more of a legislative political approach to making ensuring uh, that our amendments will get into the bill to make a good bill even better that's why we take the approach opposed and less amended, amend it. What I heard today from the advocates, everyone's in agreement with what's in agreement. And so for on the political side, I think this is still the right approach because I want this great good bill to become even better. I think we're there. I truly, I truly believe it's not any complicated or legislative thing. It's a very common sense. If you want something to happen, give your blessing, give your support, give your advocacy and put a restriction. Okay, if you're not going to listen to this thing, we're going to have an oppose and give the authority to President or Dr. Hawken. If that happens, just stay away. Why you want to be obstruction in the treatment of those people who have nobody? I see this. I'm so passionate because I see every single day somebody 
schools because but, somebody's brother, but, sister, mother, father dying because like they can't. I, I, I need to cut you off. We're not trying to obstruct anything. We're actually trying to <laughs> advance this position. All of us are trying to advance the same objective. And so, what you know, I, I, it, I, it actually I, doesn't really matter what we all say today if you delegate the authority to Dr. Hawkins and I to deal with this next week once it's in print in the way it is. So. I so, like us I, to move along. I, I, think it does, yeah. I think it does matter. And I think Dr. Krauss just came up with something that should meet everyone's um, desires here. I, but I do think exactly. that it does matter. Exactly. Then exactly. Dr. Krauss' idea is brilliant. I think motion is... on the table so we can move forward and vote on it. You want me to amend my motion? I need I need for yes. us to vote on. There's a book. Amendment. Someone can amend it, or there could be a substitute motion. So I would, I would, I would amend it to uh, to support if amended, and to delegate the authority to president, vice president, and uh, staff to change our position to oppose if it's not amended. Second. I saw second. This is Jim, I agree. All right. So Jim was the original seconder on that motion, so his agreement was what was needed. So we've got a motion. For a support if amended position with a delegation of authority to Dr. Hawkins and to myself uh, to change that position going forward based on this discussion. Um, is there any further discussion before we move to a vote? All right. Uh, Hawkins, I, sorry, Hawkins again. Um, we did we never got to support. We didn't we're, get to that. We're at support if amended. Okay. At, at least that's what I understand. That's correct. All right, Valerie, please call the roll. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Campaverdi. Aye. Dr. Ganadef. Yes. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Helzer. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiano. Yes. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Mr. Rue. Yes. Mr. Watkins? Yes. Dr. Yip? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. Uh, we are going to be moving on to agenda item uh, 20B, which is regulatory actions. But before we do that, I'm going to take a uh, nine minute break with the board returning at 1245, a quarter to one. Thanks, everyone.
All right, Sean uh, and board members, it looks like it is 1245. So if we could work to reassemble and come back on camera so we can just, uh, I can double check who's here. I am here, Madam President. So I'll have it for a second. Hi there, no problem. Looks like it might be you and me, Ryan. That's okay. That's okay. I'm here. We'll, we'll get some things done. Yeah. Board, board staff oh. is back in the hearing room, so we're ready to go too. Okay, great. Thanks. For some reason, I have lost. Well, I'll I'll solve my WebEx problem myself here. All right, for those board members who might have previously stepped away, if you could just turn your camera back on when you return, or if you have returned, excuse me, so that uh, we can tell you're back and we can get going. We need a quorum to get going again. Or I'd like to have a quorum. Gee, nine minutes is up already? It's up already. Dev. Uh, Rick. Oh, glad to finish early if we can. Uh, well, that's optimistic, so I like your optimism. Oh, always, you know that. All right, does it look like, uh, Carrie, maybe you can help me out. Does it look like uh, we have a quorum back and present and ready to go? I think so, one, two, three. I remember Still the old days number when we all had who don't have their tickets. cameras turned on. Right. Dev is back. I know Ryan Brooks is back. It looks like we're ready to go based on what I'm seeing on my screen now. Um, all right. Sorry, I Dr. Agree. Krause, did you have something to say? No, I was I was thinking about the old days when we all had flights to catch. Yes. Yeah, and people would start leaving in the afternoon. Um, it will be great if we sometime someday get back to that. All right. Uh, we will bring uh, the board back for item 20B, which is discussion and possible action on regulations. Uh, Mr. Bone, I think this is yours as well. Thank you, Madam President. This, um, the sheet, uh, item 20B, is the, the tracking chart that shows the status of all of our pending regulations and staff are happy to answer any questions that the members may have. And do any members and have I can questions? Give yeah, uh, Ms. Webb, go ahead. I can just give a super brief uh, update. Um, postgraduate training requirement regs are already approved in, in print um, as passed. The approved certifying organizations just completed its 45 day comment period. So we'll be doing a final statement of reasons on that uh, shortly. And the physician health and wellness program is in its second level re review at DCA. And maybe just one question, uh, since the postgraduate training requirements are almost complete, uh, I assume those would need to be redone <laughs> if if any changes to the PTL program are made. Yes. Okay. All yeah, right. if, if there are any changes, um, we'll have to take a look at our regs and act accordingly. Okay. Any additional questions from uh, staff? Like, yeah, excuse me, uh, four uh, staff from the members. Yeah, Dr. Ganadev. Kerry, so uh, when do you expect this PHP to go uh, to, uh, I mean, this was passed in 2017 or something? I'm just trying to figure out when we can uh, yeah, it, get the program going. There's been two two versions. So we it went through in an amendment when um, they started to propose changes to the uniform standards. Um, staff decided to restructure this so that we weren't making changes to two whole regulatory schemes 
every time there's a change to the uniform standards. So um, it, it's it's quite a large packet, and so it is taking um, DCA time to review it, and then we go back and forth on uh, proposed changes, not to the um, regulatory language, but all of the, the surrounding documents that have to go with it. But we are working through those. I, I'm I'm hoping that within the next, um, I'll say, optimistically, 90 days, it can work through DCA and get to agency, and then that they have another level of review there. Um, so, fingers crossed that it will be in print um, by the end of this year for its 45-day comment period. Okay, so before I leave the board, I can see it. <laughs> well, we will strive for that, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kevin. So, uh, Mr. quick Rube? question. Yes, uh, quick question. Um, uh, as a new board member, I, I just want to understand it. So, this is basically previous legislation that got passed or adopted by the, the California State Legislature, and now it's being uh, implemented, and it's just the status of implementation. Yes. Yes, the, the legislature authorized the boy, board to authorize the development of this program and, and the board has done that. And so the regulations have been developed. All right, any additional questions before I open it up for public comment? All right, hearing none, Sean, let's go to the public comment. Sorry about that, opening it up right now. Thank you. Anyone would like to make a public comment, please go ahead and uh, use the hand raising function or type a message into the Q&A box and we'll call on you in the order received. A few more seconds here. Okay, this time I'm not seeing any requests. Great, we'll bring it back to the board and as this is not an action item, uh, we do not need to take a vote. Uh, we don't need a motion and so we will be moving on. So thank you, uh, Mr. Bone and Ms. Webb uh, for your input here. Our next agenda item is number 21, which is an update from the Board of Registered Nursing on AB 890 with Ms. Melby. Just a moment to get Ms. Melby into the panelist role here. Ms. Melby, are you there? I am. Thank you for having me. So just a quick update on um, what's been going on from our um, standpoint with um, the implementation of 890. Um, just to kind of start off and let you guys know that our next nurse practitioner advisory committee, the agenda is posted and it will be held on August 31st. Um, the plan is for the three subcommittees that were formed by that advisory committee to report out on any recommended regulations um, for sections 101, 103, and 104. Um, so we are hoping to get um, some great input. We did already hold a stakeholders meeting. So moving right forward, if that input is received and there's not a lot of opposition from the public, we do plan on taking it to our reg um, analyst and getting some regulations in writing, some language in writing, so that it can be presented at our November board meeting for um, the board to consider to move forward. So that's our, our biggest update. Um, I did also want to let you guys know that OPES um, is working with some subject matter experts and they have held their first workshop workshops, the adult gerontology primary and acute care and the pediatric primary care. So those workshops have been held and they're moving right along on um, evaluating the examination portion of this process. Um, other than that, we do have some updates on our BRN website um, specific to 890. Our uh, BRN lawyer, uh, Reza Pezuhesh, gave us a presentation at the last board meeting on really what is within that bill just to kind of clear up any um, sorry, not Bill, in the new statute to clear up any uh, kind of question. When we did hold our stakeholders meeting, 
Um, it may not have been clear to people that this bill's already passed. So um, when we did hear um, some comments in our stakeholders meeting, it sounded like they were opposing a bill, not um, working with something that's already into law to help us with that. So that's my update. Do you guys have any questions for me? Thank you very much, Ms. Melby. Are there any questions from the board members? All right, hearing none, we'll open this up for public comment. Sean? Okay, the Q&A and hand raising features are activated. If anyone would like to make a public comment, please indicate so at this time. Everyone, a few more seconds here to see if. Time is not open. I'm not seeing any requests. All right, uh, we will bring yeah. it back to the board then. Are there any? Uh, anyone think of a comment or a question for Ms. Melby before we thank her and move on to our next agenda item? All right, well, Ms. Melby, thank you for joining us uh, at our meeting today, and we will move on to agenda item 22, update discussion and possible action on proposed agenda from the Midwifery Advisory Council. Ms. Holzer, please. It looks like you're on mute. We can't hear you. It's also you have to unmute from your computer as well as the phone if you're connected. You All go. right. I'll get this one day. By the time my term is over, I'll figure out how to do it. Okay. Can You can hear me now, right? All right. I will try and get through this really quick so you guys can go home. Um, so I'm Diane Holzer, the chair of the Midwifery Advisory uh, Council, and we are here to request that you um, approve our following agenda items for the next Midwifery Advisory Council meeting. We, uh, approval of the minutes from the August meeting, a report from the MAC chair, establishing goals for the MAC, report from the task force on possible action regarding Medi-Cal related issues, an update on proposed regulatory language for the licensed midwifery annual report, the LMAR, an update on midwifery-related legislation and sunset review, update on the midwifery program, discussion on the LMAR compliance, discussion on training for MAC members, and a presentation by the California Department of Public Health regarding newborn screening requirements and compliance. The background, our last meeting was held on August 12th, and at this meeting the following actions were taken, or we heard the following information. We approved our meeting minutes from March. We received an update from the chair and from the task force on Medi-Cal related issues, an update on the proposed regulatory language for the LMAR, an update on midwifery legislation and sunset review, and an update on the midwifery program and the LMAR summary report. And we voted to recommend to the board one public member for the vacant position on the MAC. And we also discussed training for oncoming MAC members. And that's it, if you have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Holzer. Are there any questions for Ms. Holzer, or may I have a motion to approve the MAC agenda? So moved. Second, Thank Dr. Hawkins. Thank you. Second from Dr. Hawkins. Um, are there any questions before we go to public comments? All right, seeing none, Sean, let's open up the line. The hand raising feature and the Q&A window are open for anyone wishing to make a public comment on agenda everyone about 10 more seconds all right yeah this time i'm not seeing any request great we'll bring it back to the board and if there are no further comments i'll ask Ms. caldwell to please call the roll all right Ms. caldwell Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Campoverdi. Aye. Dr. Gonadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Helzer. Yes. Dr. Krause. Yes. Ms. Lawson. Yes. Ms. Lubiana. Yes. Dr. Mahmood. Yes. Mr. Rue. Yes. Mr. Watkins. Aye. Dr. Yip. Dr. Yip. All right, the motion carries. 
is and the proposed agenda from the midwifery advisory council is approved. So we will move on to the next agenda item, which is 23 discussion and possible action on recommended appointment to the midwifery advisory council. And Ms. Holzer, you are still with us. All right, thank you. So as I said, um, on what we heard at our last meeting was we got in a, an application from Monique Webster to be appointed to the board as a public member. Um, we discussed her application and are recommending to the board that we appoint her for a three-year term that will expire June 30th of 2024. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve the recommended appointment to the MAC? So Second. Second. All right. So. I missed who approved it and seconded it. Rouse Hawkins. Rouse Hawkins, thank you. Are there any comments or questions? If not, Sean, let's open it up for public comment. Okay, the uh, hand raising and Q&A feature available. If anyone wish to make public comment, please indicate so. In about 10 seconds here. This time I'm not seeing any requests. Thank you. We'll bring it back to the board. And if there are no public, excuse me, no board member comments, I'll ask Ms. Caldwell to please perform the roll call vote. All right, Ms. Caldwell. Valerie. Yeah. The yeah. audio is not coming through. Give us just one moment. Okay, no problem. Mr. Brooks? Aye. Thank you. Ms. Campaverdi? Aye. Dr. Gonadev? Aye. Dr. Hawkins? Yes. Dr. Helzer? Yes. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? Yes. Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Mr. Rue? Yes. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Dr. Yip? Dr. Yip? All right, the motion carries. And the appointment to the MAC has been approved. Um, now we're going to uh, go back to the items that we skipped from yesterday. Uh, the first of which is agenda item 13, the update on progress made from the April 2021 public stakeholder meeting. Mr. Prasivka, this one's for you. Uh, thank you very much. In terms of an update on the progress made since the public stakeholder meeting, uh, there was an additional public stakeholder meeting held on the 29th of July. That was attended by 10 board members. There were 15 individual speakers uh, from the public stakeholder side. There was an agenda of three items. The first agenda was a video explaining the enforcement process. Uh, the staff have been working incorporating suggestions in relation to that video and also future videos which will be produced in terms of enforcement. The second item is an update on the online complaints tracking system. Uh, that work is ongoing. It particularly involves uh, changes that will be needed to be made into the BREE system to have a complaint tracking system for complainants and that work is ongoing. And the third item was a presentation upon the new website and subsequent to comments received there have been a number of changes to the website including a blue a blue blue banner alert system in relation to upcoming meetings as well as uh, uh, an uh, easy way to register from the meetings following the blue banner and i'd be happy to take any questions Thank you very much, Mr. Prasivka. Are there any questions uh, for Bill about the progress made? All right, let's open it up for public comment, Sean. 
Okay, the hand raising feature and Q&A box are open for anyone wishing to make a public comment. First up, we have Rosie Arthur's daughter. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? You can. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I did attend the uh, earlier stakeholders meeting, but I was not able to attend the one on the 29th. However, uh, I had previously made uh, suggestions regarding ADA accessibility, which you said yesterday had been addressed, and I understand it's an ongoing project. So that was your third item here, talking about the new website and such. And there are definitely still both ADA issues and other issues regarding the site presentation, either what's available or how you can access it as well as how to access the meetings, et cetera. So as Mr. Uh, well, his first name's Eric, yesterday pointed out that when his broadband access went down, there was no way to access that by telephone. So this would be not only just ADA accessibility, this would be accessibility for the public in general. So there are still, room for improvement in the ADA and general accessibility to the website. Okay. There were a number of organizational issues that are still identified as being problematic and those are administrative issues, but they still need to be addressed. On the new website, I haven't had a chance since I didn't know it had been updated, although I did notice it did look different. I just did a quick check on some of the links regarding laws and certain ones are either hidden because they just go to a general section and some are still totally missing such as the link to the health and um, safety code 124 960 and 961 for the intractable pain patients uh, act and then the accompanying uh, statutes for physicians to allow treatment of these patients has been hidden in uh, a general part in the business of professional code. So if you don't know where to go to look for it, you can't find it. And these used to both be um, under a link so that you could find them easily. And that's a part of accessibility is you need to be able to find things easily that are there. Um, then there are still some uh, matters regarding Another item coming down here, but this, we still have yet to have the intractable pain slash legacy patient 15 seconds ring agenda item that has been promised now for years, as well as the tax force that was promised six years ago. We need that access. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Eric Andrews. Eric, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Please go ahead. Uh, see, this is what I mean by you all skewing how you convey information, always to put yourselves in a good light. Bill did not just properly convey what a failure the advocate meeting was for the board members who chose not to attend. Bill created an agenda of things that none of the advocates wanted to discuss, and we ended up having to spend the last portion of the meeting letting them all know that. As I said yesterday, these meetings were created so that we can talk to you all about things that we're not allowed to cover at these quarterly meetings, yet we weren't contacted or allowed to put things on the agenda for our own meeting, and it back backfired big time. Now you're shutting us down at the quarterly meetings, not letting us talk on agenda items, and which is against the law, and I will talk about that a little bit later, Christina. Um, but when it comes to these public advocate meetings, you're not including us hardly at all. You expect us to just sit there and listen to your agenda items and, and then comment on it. That's not what we wanted to talk about. We had prepared things. We take time out of our lives to sit there and spend all that time with you only to have you guys control it and make sure that we don't get to speak about what we want. We have to speak about what you want. That's not going to work. And I'm going to always encourage advocates not to attend these meetings as long as you control them that way and don't let us have any say in what we're going to talk about at these meetings and it's bill should not have just conveyed that report as a success because that meeting was a 100 percent failure thank you thank you for your public comment up next we have marion hollingsworth 
Marion, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Marion Hollingsworth. While it's good that we're having these stakeholder meetings, they are not meeting the goal of better understanding when the board alone decides what topics will be covered. You deciding what subjects will be discussed implies that you are putting stakeholders in their place and telling us how things will be addressed, kind of like a shut up and sit down because we are in charge type of attitude. Advocates should have the ability to suggest topics we would like addressed instead of the unilateral approach to topics now. At the very least, include advocates in deciding the agenda. That would inspire better conversation and understanding. Also, I'm glad stakeholder input resulted in some changes to the new website look more improvement is needed. I recently found some doctors who had been disciplined after being convicted for sexual misconduct, and those convictions were not listed on their profiles on the website. So if you could make those changes, I could discuss that with um, enforcement or your web person at a later time. But uh, I'd like to just listen, have, have you listen to us more at these stakeholder meetings, make it more of an inclusive um, situation instead of you just telling us what to do. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. This time there are no additional questions queue. Thank you. Uh, I'll bring that back, bring this item back to the board. And as it's an update item, there's no action necessary from the board members. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item 14, which is an update on the Health Professions Education Foundation, Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Gananadev. Um, and I was very interested to hear yesterday that Dr. Excuse me, Mr. Rue used to be a part of it um, as well. So in any event, Dr. Hawkins and Dr. Gananadev with an update, please. Dr. Hawkins, uh, I thought you were going to do the update. Where did, where did he go? Well, let's find out. One second. I I've lost my ability to. Speak. I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. Can, I hear, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry about that. Got to push the button. <laughs> Health Education Foundation HPEF quarterly meeting occurred virtually July 11, 2021. Dr. Ganadef and I participated. HPEF improves access to healthcare in underserved areas of California by providing scholarship and loan repayment programs to health professional students and graduates who are dedicated to providing direct patient care in those communities. In return for the support, recipients agreed to provide direct patient care in the medical underserved area of California for a period of one to three years. HPEF is a 501c3 housing office of statewide health planning, OSHPED. Physician license fees are part of the financial support of HPEF. The next application cycle for the Stephen Thompson and various loan repayment programs opens in September 2021. Other scholarship programs application cycles open in January 2022. Details can be reviewed at the OSHPOD website, oshpd.ca.gov. Please share with your contacts. In my last update to the board, I indicated that OSHPED had been elevated to a department. This is Assembly Bill 133. This will be the Department of Healthcare Access Information. Once the legislature passes and the governor signs relevant bills, dissolution of HPEF and its board will occur no later than October 1st, 2021. Financial support for physician from physician life license fees will continue, but it's not clear to me how or if the medical board will participate in this new department. Please read the details of this new department and HPEF at oshped.ca.gov. Next meeting of HPEF, perhaps this last one, is scheduled for October for September 8, 2021, starting at 10 a.m. Interested parties are invited. Uh, Dr. Ganadev, do you have any additional things to add to this? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Hawkins. I, I just want to make sure that we did get that last information that uh, after September, September 8th meeting or September 9th meeting is actually to dissolve the board, uh, HPEF board. So the board doesn't exist by new statute signed by governor. So after October 1st, it doesn't exist. So my, I did pose uh, a question to uh, new, sign, new cabinet secretary of uh, ASHPAD, which is going to be the agency, which will be a department now. So to see how, what input medical board has on the 
and the Stephen Thompson uh, loan repayment program. And their answer was, if I recall, that there will be a committee. So I think, uh, Mr. Prapiska, we need to get a little more involved as the HPEF goes away. Uh, for because major the the funding for these programs comes from our licenses. We get additional funding from say fines and the insurance companies and any insurance company mergers and all that, but the primary funding comes from us. So we have to have involvement. Now there is no board. And we I personally felt it was okay because it was a struggle to see we as a not separate 501c3 not-for-profit board, there were certain responsibilities as board of directors, but also as part of state agency, it's totally different. So it, it was a struggle for, uh, for the past few years I've been on what we expect them to do, what they can give us. So they must have taken it there to eliminate the board, but uh, our interest should be in that loan repayment program, Steve Thompson loan repayment program. So we should not let it just disappear and let the new, new uh, State Department uh, decide on that one without input from medical board. That's all I can say. Thanks, Dr. Gananadev uh, and Dr. Hawkins. Are there any comments or questions from board members about HPATH? All right, let's open this uh, up for public comment, please. Hey, the hand raising and Q&A box are open for anyone wishing to make a public comment on this agenda item. First up, we have Rosie Arthur Zetter. Rosie, are you there? Hello, yes, can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Okay, great. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that um, your board is going away and yet you still have a, uh, a desire to, keep it running, which I think is is very good and maybe it'll have to adapt in a, some sort of a different way. Um, one of the ways might be to allow um, for training on current issues, uh, education that you know extends to facilitating uh, patient care, good patient care where the uh, many of the resources, as you say, are based in the insurance industry, and they have one thing in mind, and the last thing on the mind is the patient receiving uh, the best or appropriate care. It's generally on the bottom line. So you'll see things like in the documentation that we have regarding um, controlled substances, some medications are not mentioned at all, or what information you have is like 30 years old and hasn't been updated. So when that was inherited and gifted by the insurance company in 2015 and accepted, it became basically the standard of care. And at the same time, it was using woefully outdated information and didn't even include medications that were mentioned elsewhere on the board, um, but sparingly. So, it seems that to open it up to enlightenment, shall we say, or to bringing science back into um, the education process as opposed to compliance to other entities, you know, might be a way to refresh it and uh, get more support. Anyway, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. This time there are no additional requests. Thank you, Sean, and we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, if there are no comments from board members, we'll move on. All right, Hi. hearing none. I'm sorry, go ahead. Was there a comment? Okay, hearing none, we're gonna move on to agenda item 15, which is an update on the physician assistant board. And Dr. Hawkins, you are a busy person uh, because this is you as well. The Physician Assistant Board last met August 9th, 2021. I participated and provided an update of medical board activities. I was appointed to the PA Board by the Governor Newsom in June 2020. PA Board agenda materials from this meeting are available at pab.ca.gov. 
BNP Code 3500 addresses physician assistance. Historically, the medical board performed administrative discipline and enforcement for the physician assistant board. The physician assistant board now handles all administrative discipline and enforcement. There are a number of proposed amendments to BNP 3500 striking reference to jurisdiction and oversight by the medical board of California. Physician assistants, however, still require a supervising physician and a collaborative agreement. Physician assistants cannot practice independently. The medical board also retains the ability to prevent disciplined physicians from supervising physician assistants. I believe the medical board, I believe medical board participation should continue on the PA uh, board. This is a non voting position, but it is no less important in my opinion. There are a few additionals finally. The PA board adopted a new physician assistant board logo that they were very proud of. Finally, on May 27, 2021, the American Academy of Physician Assistants, AAPA, House of Delegates proposed a resolution affirming a title change of the physician assistant profession from physician assistant to physician associate. They feel this was needed to eliminate a common misconception that physician assistants assist rather than more accurately collaborate, diagnose, and treat. The PA board has advised use of this new title in California requires legislative and regulatory change to incorporate this new title. The next PA board meeting is Monday, November 8th, 2021 at 830 in the morning. That ends my report. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Are there any questions from members? All right, let's open it up for public comment. Sean, please. The Q&A window and hand-raising features have been activated for anyone wishing to make a public comment on this agenda item. First up, we have Rosie Arthur's daughter. Rosie, are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, one of the things I've mentioned before was this whole um, advent of the electronic medical record. And for the most part, until this year, I think April, Patients didn't have any access to that, at least in Ms. some- Ms. Arthur's daughter, this is yeah. a, the, the agenda item here is yes. the Physician Assistant Board Update by Dr. Yes. Hawkins. Yes. Give a comment on the Physician yes. Board Update. Okay. Because physician assistants are included in these records and the way the records are compiled, for the most part, they are copy and pasted from other records. So you will find a physician assistant attached to a record that they may not have even treated. You'll find their supervising physician attached to the record and you can't tell who made what orders or whatever. So it would seem to be to ask to change it to something like associate has some implications that they may not be considering considering the hierarchy of responsibility that uh, exists uh, in the, the legal field. So we have people now accessing these records and finding out that this person treated me, I don't know who that person is. That person treated me, I don't know who they are. And yet their name is attached to an order where they may or may not have even treated a pa patient. So it's opening a can of worms to be taking on more responsibility without knowing maybe that there's a whole um, Pandora's box of records that you may not even know your name is attached to. I have seen records where they said a, a chiropractor. Can you, can so, you focus your comments on Dr. Hawkins' board update? Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I think it would be wise to um, not change things because you can't anticipate what's going to come out in the future that will uh, be destabilizing or adversely affect not only the professional um, person, but the patient. And again, when people are given responsibility and taking responsibility, you, know, you have expectations. And it doesn't seem to be a wise time to be changing titles to take on more responsibility in some people's minds. 15 seconds then, ring. then you might be jumping into quicksand. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for your public comment. This time there's no additional question queue. 
Thank you, Sean, and we'll bring this one back to the board. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hawkins, uh, for serving on that board and for the update uh, to all of us. We will move on to agenda item 16, which is update on revising guidelines for prescribing controlled substances for pain. This is Mr. Prasivka, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I really have to note that you have given me the honor of being the last presenter at this board meeting. It's an honor of which I am completely unworthy, but I will instead continue on. Um, there was a meeting with the executive staff and the task force on the 3rd of May. And at that meeting, the task force gave the executive certain jobs that it would like to see done to kick the project off. And that is what we have proceeded to do. Uh, the job of the executive was significantly enhanced when we were able to retain um, a retired annuitant, a very senior uh, retired enforcement manager, Susan Cady, to assist us with the project. And I want to simply indicate that she's a great asset to us and brings a huge amount of experience and is really uh, a very important part of the project. The initial phase, we were to research the new laws and regu regulatory changes that had occurred since 2014. In addition, to look at what had happened in 2014 in such very important external agencies as the California Department of Public Health, Center for Disease and Control, Food and Drug Administration, to identify those sections in the guidelines which may require amendment to conform to the updated guidelines. We have done a complete analysis of those guidelines, and in particular, we have identified certain sections of those guidelines in which it will be necessary for us to get the expertise of subject matter experts, uh, and the staff have been working on compiling a list of subject matter experts, uh, hoping to match them with the sections of the guidelines which are most in need of updating. We have reached out to individual board members. I'd like to express, uh, express our appreciation to Dr. Hilzer, who has a lot of experience in this area and has been very generous in terms of giving us uh, contacts. We've been reaching out to a number of uh, sources. We're in the final stages of vetting those subject matter experts, and we expect to bring them to the task force committee in the very near future. Uh, that's all we have to say at the moment. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Do board members have any questions, Mr. Prasivka? Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, so I I think the many of the chronic pain suffering patients feel that our guidelines went too far against them getting the appropriate treatment and we are going after their doctors. So I want you to make sure that you do work with the pain management people to really assist you in this one. We need to be fair. We need to take care of uh, suffering people. So it's it's very important for you to work with and come up with the appropriate guidelines so that they don't feel they, their doctors are unable to prescribe to them because of uh, they're afraid to do so uh, uh, because of the medical board. If I can just comment on that very briefly. No, we completely agree with you. We're totally um, engaged in that particular project. And also it is a project, uh, the engagement is not limited to simply updating the guidelines, which will take at least a year to do that. As you know, we have immediate problems now. There was the closure of these LAGS clinics in which literally very large numbers of patients found themselves without care. So we have been reaching out to the relevant uh, uh, stakeholders to forming uh, a public release that we can give to give guidance, particularly there. We are well aware of the problem when doctors inherit legacy patients who have been on these drugs for a long period of time. And that's certainly a gap in which the existing guidelines can be seen to be lacking. So we are not only looking at it from the point of view of revising the guidelines, but we've been actively working to formulate a position, which in the short term we can uh, release. And uh, we've been making some progress there and we hope we can do something very shortly. And of course, we'll keep the president completely informed of that. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you for, uh, for that answer. And I think uh, after we come up, we need to inform these doctors. I think that's important because they 
what I hear from patients is that their doctors are so afraid to write these prescriptions and the ones who are suffering are the patients. So just, just make sure that we communicate to these doctors too. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? All right, Sean, let's open it up for public comment, please. Okay, the Q&A window and the hand raising feature open. For anyone wishing to make a public comment, please indicate so now. First up, we have Rosie Arthur-Stutter. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, I have been in extensive conversation with the board regarding this matter for more than seven years now. And and I've seen the development of what happened and done root cause analysis, et cetera. So I've identified long ago where the problems are. And I've worked in the field. So, and I've worked in uh, diversion programs, et cetera. And I've worked with disabled folks for, for years, decades, decades. Now here's the problem. It's wonderful to have all this um, talk, but there's little action. Uh, what was suggested here that we need to put stuff out there so the doctors know that was there and that was intentionally removed from the site. Those things need to be returned to the site. There's nothing that keeps them off the site other than trying to keep people from getting the information that is both the general public patients, consumers, and the doctors that treat them. There is, there are rumors going out and they're, they're provocated by uh, people trying to sell certain types of treatment programs. I won't, but you know what they are. They are telling physicians that the laws have changed when they have not and that they have to follow the 2016 CDC guidelines that were never meant for legacy patients, intractable pain patients, or pain management specialists. So as a default, if they are treated, they are being cut back to less than 50 um, morphine equivalents a day. Stable patients are then prescribed medications that are contraindicated to them. They're having heart attacks. They're having worse problems with uh, arthritis, et cetera. Some of them are developing uh, abdominal aortic aneurysms because they've been overprescribed non steroid anti inflammatory medications with the big black box warnings ignored. All because somebody is misinforming them that the law has changed and that they have to take these legacy patients and take away their pain relief. They will take the record and they will change what the record says. They won't record the correct lab findings, for example. It is horrible, but you see, when you look at the records and this is across the board for different entities, different practices, et cetera, this needs to be fixed. There's no reason to be using outdated formularies that are, were given to you from workers comp insurance companies and ignore up to, and ignore up to date ones. You know, it's just not right. And that was an administrative choice to do that. So we need to look at those administrative choices and start fixing them. And you need an internal audit to get started. And I'll be happy to show you where the problems are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. This time there are no additional questions queued. Great. Uh, Hawkins, may I comment? Please, please. So um, I agree with uh, Dr. Ganadev's um, comments uh, on this item. And not to diminish uh, Ms. Arthur Daughter's comments, one thing in the panel I've noticed is that when we have the proper expert, for example, there's a there's an allegation of harm, and there's been high doses of uh, opioids, et cetera. But the proper experts, we are educated to the fact that these doses are not these doses can be appropriately be prescribed by a, uh, a pain management specialist. 
So I understand that there's a lack of uh, pain specialists and that we need to look at this class of patients. There is some attention given to this group of patients and uh, doctors are not always disciplined for using very, very high doses of medications. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins. Additional comments? All right, seeing none, we are going to move on to the next agenda item, uh, which is uh, agenda item 24, going back to our uh, today's agenda. Uh, this item is regular election of officers pursuant to the administrative manual. Uh, I just wanted to give the board uh, the context for why you are seeing an election occurring less than a year after the election that occurred um, in November. Um, the board's administrative manual does set the requirements uh, for our elections. It requires that we elect our officers at the first meeting of the fiscal year, which is this meeting. Uh, when we elected the officers last November, we elected the officers off cycle uh, due to some extension of terms uh, as a result of COVID-19. Um, and because, because at the time, uh, Denise Pines, our then president, uh, was leaving the board because of the expiration of her term. Um, and uh, I, I wasn't going to be able to continue to serve in that capacity. Um, so the manual also states uh, with respect to, so elections need to be held at this meeting. It states that officers shall serve for a term uh, of one year. Officers may be reelected, may serve for more than one term. Uh, you as a board or us as a board uh, can elect our officers by slate. Uh, we can uh, elect them individually. Uh, I will uh, let you all know that I would love to stay in this position if you'll have me, but we're going to accept nominations uh, from the floor and I'll let Dr. Hawkins, who serves as the board's vice president, uh, and Lori Lubiano, who serves um, as the board's secretary currently, uh, let us know if they'd like to continue in these positions as well. But we will accept uh, nominations uh, from the floor you know, for, for anyone who'd like to nominate someone or nominate themselves. But Dr. Ms. Howard, yeah. I'd like to nominate uh, Ms. Lawson as continuous president. All right. Thank you. Uh, actually, Madam Chair, I'd like to nominate the slate, uh, Ms. Lawson as the president, Dr. Hawkins as the vice president, and Ms. Lubiano as the secretary. So that way we can get it done. You've been there less than a year. I think you guys are doing a good job. I second. All right, thank you. I, I do think that that uh, the proper order of business, however, is not to second that, but to see if there are additional nominations. Correct. All right. Hearing none, I guess, uh, Carrie, is the proper order of business then to vote on that slate of nominations? Actually, it's to call for public comment, I believe, right? <laughs> right, yes. right. Yes. Okay. So I, I guess I close nominations for all of the positions because we're going to take them all at once. Uh, no one else having provided nominations. Uh, and we'll open up the public comment line, please. Okay, the Q&A window and the hand raising features have been activated for individuals making, wishing to make a public comment. We're on a few more seconds here. At this time, I'm not seeing any requests in the queue. All right, uh, let's bring it back to the board uh, and Ms. Caldwell, if you will please perform a roll call vote uh, on this slate. Uh, continuing. Mr. Brooks. Aye. Ms. Campaverdi. Aye. Dr. Ganadev. Aye. Dr. Hawkins. Yes. Dr. Helzer. Yes. Dr. Krauss? Yes. Ms. Lawson? Yes. Ms. Lubiano? What? Yes. <laughs> um, Dr. Mahmood? Yes. Mr. Rue? Yes. yes. Mr. Watkins? Aye. Dr. Yip? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for your uh, confidence. Congratulations to Dr. Hawkins and Ms. Lubiano, uh, and I look forward to continuing to work with all of you. 
and continuing to work on our sunset. <laughs> Uh, all right, we'll move on to the next agenda item 25 future agenda items. Do any members have agenda items they would like to propose for future meetings? Ms. Howard. Yeah. Please. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Ms. Castro of uh, the Attorney General's office. Speak to us specifically with reference to disciplinary guidelines. Uh, and to discuss some of the uh, reasons uh, where we may not always uh, follow the, the guidelines uh, to the letter uh, in relation to age of cases, uh, strength of experts, patient or family support. Uh, I, I think that uh, having her insight will be very helpful to the board and to the public in terms of understanding the challenges that we face every day. Thank you. And just, uh, I, I should have said for the benefit uh, of new members who haven't had a chance to, uh, you know, have this item or, or consider this, um, we take all these agenda items and then we work with staff, uh, you know, behind the scenes, of course, to develop the agenda for the next meeting, but we take a list of all of these and then, you know, uh, uh, the vice president and I go through with staff, um, you know, and time things out and find presenters and all of that. So feel free to uh, propose anything that would be of interest to you that you'd like uh, to hear more about at a future board meeting. So thanks, Howard, Thank we've got that one down. Great, and this is Ryan Brooks. I'd like to get a follow-up from Ms. Briscoe on my requests at the second, my second meeting on the recidivism rate over the last 10 years um, for doctors. And the purpose of, you know, and that was to see if our guidelines are working and we're adequately protecting the public. Yeah, if I could just interject there quite briefly, you know, this is a matter which we have been actively working with our um, with our technical staff. Um, it has turned out to be a um, to raise a number of technical issues, but that is not going to deter us from trying to uh, make some progress on the project. Uh, by the time of the next meeting. Thank you. Additional agenda yeah. item. This is Lori. I have um, okay. Go for it. Um, one is a follow up. <clears throat> I think uh, in previous board meetings, the public as well as our fellow board members have asked about a training on being trauma informed and what that means. So I'd like to re-raise that. And the second, um, thinking of some of the callers also, I would like some information or presentation on um, what the diversity, equity, inclusion efforts are uh, of the medical board um, overall, not, not just internal with staff, but in terms of outreach as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lubiano. It's Dr. Mahmoud. Can Please. Please. Yeah. So I want to bring in a new issue. I want to uh, get um, some more input on mental health uh, of uh, definitely for physicians in our state but all the healthcare provider or medical board can do, especially in this context of last two years of uh, pandemic, which is ongoing, and it is really creating a whole lot of mental health problem. And I think this is a very compelling issue. Nobody is putting in attention. We should take a lead on that. Thank you. Uh, I agree with that, Dr. Mahmood. If there are uh, presenters or uh, people that you know that you want to pass along uh, that would be good good speakers on this topic. We'd appreciate those. I know I'm trying to think, um, Carrie, and, and those of you who've been on the board sometime, we had a what I thought was an excellent presentation at one point from a physician at Stanford, um, but that dates back sometime. So in any event, if anyone has, a, has recommendations for speakers, um, we, we'd love to have those as well. And you can provide those offline. This is Jim Helzer. In follow up to Dr. Skipper's presentation this morning, um, I would appreciate a, a more detailed presentation on, on what a physician health program would look like 
the structure and function and how it would interact with the board's disciplinary process. Great. That it sounds to me, and maybe Carrie, we, you know, I, I just in thinking about what that might look like too, an update on what's been proposed in the regulations and, and kind of where we're already um, at, because we had an update on where the regulations are at in the regulatory process today, but not an update on uh, what was being proposed. So we can certainly do that, uh, Dr. Helzer. Thank you. Uh, additional agenda items. All right, let's open it up for public comment on this item. Okay, the hand raising function and Q&A window are open for anyone wishing to make public comment. First up, we have Susan Lauren. Susan, are you there? Yes, hi. Um, I have I would like to have an agenda item on changing liposuction code 1356.6 and the related issues. Um, we're not doing anything to protect the public from from what is not a helpful process, but is removing part of an endocrine organ from the body and causing a lot of problems across the board. I'd like to present in that. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Eric Andrews. Eric, are you there? I'm here. I know it's useless to even suggest an agenda item, but I'll play along. By the way, Carrie just gave a presentation on the disciplinary guidelines in May. Does Howard think maybe she was wrong and we need Gloria to do it instead? First, I'd like you to think about putting together a panel of doctors and advocates that would go through MBC closed cases with personal information redacted to see if the panel comes up with the same decision as the medical board to close the case. It will either draw a light to a serious problem or it will help show the public that there are justified reasons for the cases being closed. Second, this is my 452nd request to have an agenda item on the Public Records Act. And lastly, I would also like an agenda item to discuss shutting down the public when the, bu the board president feels someone is not speaking on the agenda topic. The Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act Section 1125.7c states, Quote, the state body shall not prohibit public criticism of policies, programs, or services of the state body or the acts or emissions of the state body, close quote. In talking about AB 1278, it was made very clear in the discussion, including from Wendy Connect, who is the driving force behind the bill, that the CMA's influence on the bill itself and the version you were voting on was significant. My agenda comment was about this CMA influence on the bill, which Christina chose to distort and say was off topic. By law, I'm allowed to criticize the voting on a bill that has been purposely watered down by an organization who has a track record for thwarting patient safety bills and other issues. Christina was out of line and in violation of the law, not only interrupting me and taking up my time, but for telling Sean to shut me down. Is the stopwatch stopped when Christina interrupts people or is she purposely taking away people's time? Thankfully, I recorded the video, so I'll put it on social media. This needs to be discussed and if it continues, I will report it to the attorney general's there office as a violation an item about future agenda items. Yes, I'm asking for an agenda item. Thank you. As a violation of the open meeting laws, the city of Bakersfield had to pay more than $100,000 in attorney fees after a judge ruled that the city council voted open meeting laws violated open meeting laws. Remember, board members can call for a point of order when they see a law is being broken. Christina, you do a good job, but you're getting a little big for your britches. You are not a monarchy. I'll be eagerly awaiting your apology for violating my rights. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Rosie Arthur's there. Rosie, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I wanted to make one comment uh, first regarding the comment that was made after I talked about uh, the uh, physician's discipline and that people prescribing high opioids, if it's intractable pain, may not be disciplined. And that's uh, Business and Professional Codes 2220.5, item three. Unfortunately, it comes three instead of at the top, which means that oftentimes, the cases get decided by number one when three is applicable. And so that causes great injustice, not only to the professional, but to the patients, because when one professional loses their license, 
there's hundreds, maybe thousands of patients and their advocates who are adversely impacted. When you have chronic pain or a legacy patient, you can't change to another provider. Nobody will take you on. So it's either stick with your provider and hope that he'll treat you or die because that's what happens when you, you can't get your medicine. Now, as far as I would still like the intractable pain agenda item put back on here like it was supposed to be last year. We've never had it. I'll contact um, Mr. Prosecco with some suggestions as to who might be good to do that. But we need to have real information out there. And then uh, secondly, this board needs to consider doing at least an internal audit. First of all, to see where the problems are. Many of them are administrative. So when you're trying to do what you're supposed to do following the law, part of what keeps you from doing that is the fact that administratively, those access or connections or links have been removed, like Business and Professional Code 2220.53 or the Intractable Pain Act. Those have been removed not only from the, the guide, but from the website. They used to be there. It's a simple matter. Put them back. The, the public, the consumers, the doctors deserve to know what the law is, not what somebody selling that therapy is telling them that the law has changed when it hasn't, or people thinking that for me. following the 2016 CDC guides instead of the 2019, which rescinded it. People have to have the right information available to them and not removed from the site because it's not convenient administratively. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. Up next, we have Michelle Montserrat Ramos. Michelle, are you there? Yes, I am. It's Michelle Montserrat Ramos from Consumer Watchdog. We would like an agenda item that outlines how enforcement works with other departments and organizations that conduct quality of care investigations. We're having issues with enforcement not accepting or using California Department of Public Health investigation results that directly link to the conduct of the provider. Previously, these organizations have written letters to the board and they were not utilized and the cases were dismissed. We would hope that the different investigatory departments, boards, and bureaus would work together in the best interest of consumers. Please consider this agenda item. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment. At this time, there are no additional requests in queue. All right, thanks. We'll bring that back to the board. Are there any other agenda items from board members? Yeah, uh, Madam President, I want to echo something, you know, Eric said, and I'm apologize. I don't want to butcher his last name, but it's something I brought up also maybe having a workshop, not an agenda item on kind of the process of how we evaluate maybe mock cases. Um, you know, it's really interesting, you know, when you get into closed session, all the different nuances that the public just might not see that go into you know the decision making process. You know, why a case in 2010 is now just getting to the board today. You know, it's not necessarily because the board didn't take any action or it might have been lawsuits and other, you know, extenuating factors. Why a case took so long or why the guidelines may be, you know, changed or not adopted. I think that might be a good exercise for a workshop and it's a board item. And so I would like us to maybe discuss that at the next meeting. I, I like that suggestion a lot. And uh, I, if you'd be willing, we can work on that together offline to sort of design what that might look like. Cause I think that would be really helpful and useful. Yeah, thank you. All right. Are there any other agenda items? If not, we'll move to item 26, which is adjournment. Uh, Dr. Gananadev, you jinxed us. We're now over because you said we were going to end early. Uh, we're ending uh, just 24 minutes uh, over uh, the time we had anticipated, uh, but there being no further business, the meeting's adjourned. Uh, thank you to all the board members uh, for participating today. Thank you to all the members of the public who joined us as well. 
a thank you to staff for preparing us for this meeting uh, and sticking with us uh, through the meeting. The next meeting of our board is scheduled for November 9th, excuse me, 18th and 19th, uh, 2021. Uh, so we will see you all uh, then. And I know I'll talk to some of you before then. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Congratulations. Thank Bye. you. Thank you all. Bye.